Welcome back to the Comics Aficionados Live on a special Sunday edition right here on Thinking Critical YouTube. We've got a special guest in the house, Mr. Mark Miller, the man behind Miller World. It's a huge week for you. you got the final issue of The Magic Order Volume 4. The Chosen One debuted on Netflix this week. How's everything going, buddy? It's been a funny old week, I've got to tell you. You know, like, I mean, whenever your show launches and that book finishes that week and then I'm pimping next week's book, I'm like, no wonder I drink. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you still got big game to come out. Oh, God, there's, yeah, there's that as well. <laughs> yeah, that's out next week. It's, it's turned out well, by the way. I'm really happy. But, I mean, Pepe Laraz, have you been following it? Are you checking oh, it out? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's been enjoying Big Game. It's great. I'm, I'm really happy with it. It's good. I'm glad because it pulls together 20 years of stories. And if it had sucked, I'd have been devastated. I'm so pleased it worked out as well as it was. <laughs> been mapping this out for two decades. And <laughs> would want it to fail like, there. 20, the last years thing. In the, 20 years in the making, and then it's like, oh, it blows. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like running back a 99-yard interception, and all of a sudden you fumble on the goal line. Like, you can't do it. <laughs> you just can't. We haven't read the last issue yet. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> oh, no. I can't imagine it not, uh, not actually delivering. And obviously, the Pepe the Raz art, it seems like you had a good choice in mind with that one. Do you know, I've been really lucky, like, you know, getting Jorge Jimenez, you know, Pepe Larraz, Frank Quitely this year, Travis Shere, Olivia Coipel. I'm like, come on, Marvel and DC, come on, challenge me. Challenge me getting these guys. <laughs> <laughs> So you just moved this week, and that's what's happened then? We actually bought this house about two years ago, and um, it's, it was built in the 1700s, right? And, and I don't think – I think the plumbing is about 250 years old. You know, there, there, was, <laughs> there was, like, everything needing done. So we, we had builders in for 18 months, and they are just wrapping up just now, you know? So we're finally in the house. We were living around the corner. We finally just moved in. So, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a tiny tour of the – there's the office here just now, you know, so – it's going to be great when it's tidied up a bit, you know. So I've got all my all my stuff in here now. That's Christopher Reeve's Superman cape over in that box over there. I was oh, about to ask no where it went. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Do you still have Christopher Reeve's cat? Uh, I've got the cat. Yeah, the cat's in the box downstairs. Yeah, the cat. <laughs> I love the idea that somebody was so resourceful that when the cat from Superman the movie died, you know, they stuffed it and stuck it on eBay, and I bought. It. <laughs> So obviously you're an enormous Superman fan. I think that's what a lot of people have, uh, I've been hearing would like to hear from you. Is this thing for Superman next year really going to happen? For, with me? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I said to the Netflix guys, I, I was weird. I was I was in the Middle East and I was out swimming, right? And it was, you know, sometimes ideas just hit you in funny times. And I was swimming in the sea. And I was just thinking, God, that's like kind of good scene in a Superman story. And then the whole thing just came to me, right? I mean, from start to finish, the whole thing just came before I got back, and I said to my wife and my kids, don't talk to me, I need to write this down, you know, and I got a pen and I just wrote everything down. It was a weird thing, you know, and I came in and wrote it all down. And I just mentioned on Twitter, look, I'll, I'll never write this, but I had a good idea for a Superman story. And then DC contacted me and they said, look, we'd love you to do this. This would be amazing, you know. So, like, um, I, I've got a break where I could I could take three months and write it towards the end of next year. And I'm, I'm 100% going to do it, 100%. And I've got a Batman awesome. idea as well, you know. Don't know when I can get to do that, but like, I just feel there's something weird going on just now where I really feel like guys like me and 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 you know guys who've worked in the industry for a while and been very lucky had a lot of big books and everything. We've got to man the stations, you know. Like everybody's got. I think everybody's got to come in and do a couple of projects and find an artist who's as good as they can possibly get and just do some killer run on something, you know. Like build up some I, momentum. The, re the retailers are they're struggling out there, you know. Like they're, they're dying. I mean, all my friends and retailers saying it's never been, they've never known it's hard as this. And I was like, okay, let's let's get Olivia Coypel and Pepe Larraz or whatever, and we go and do a Captain America and a Wolverine run or something, you know. Just do everybody's got to come back and do two two runs, you know. And 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 if twenty big name writers and twenty big name artists do that, you've got an amazing couple of years of comic books, you know. We just we need to get something like that going again. You want to see some excitement at Marvel and DC again, I think. Agreed. So you will, obviously you are the proprietor of Fantastic Comics in Berkeley, California. Do you think that'll help? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about it many a time. I'm not sure who 
you know, usually there's two names that come up when we're talking about superstars in comics. And often, you know, Mark's name comes up and Todd McFarlane. Well, Todd and I should do a book. No, oh, yeah. I wouldn't say, well, I mean, that could happen. Yeah, I mean, sure. Good. I mean, <laughs> truthfully, uh, Todd McFarlane can go and do what he wants to do, and that would be okay on its own. And you can do what you want to do, and that'd be okay on its own. And then you get two rather than one. I'm just kind of thinking that way. But if you want to write Spider Man, I would recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark- because that's the book it needs to be, of course. Everybody knows that. And yeah, Spawn, you know. People forget this, though. Right? Think of every time in history whenever comics has been through a boom. I mean, nobody wants to hear this, right? Because we do well at a creator own. It's great to work on something that then becomes a movie and you maybe have a run of books like Saga or something that do incredibly well, you know? But in reality, in the last 10 years, there hasn't been any real big blow up success in the creator own world, you know? Saga was probably the last one that went crazy. I mean, things have done well, you know? They've done done nicely. But Saga was the last time there was a phenomenon, I think, in Walking Dead. Prior to that, yeah. never, you know, so th- there's been a few, but but like um, the real success comes for the industry. And I'm t- not talking about as individuals, as creators. It comes from the industry when Marvel and DC are doing well, particularly Marvel. And again, people hate to hear this because you're making money for the man. You know, you're, you're, you're showing up uh, a corporation. But the honest truth is that creator own growth comes from Marvel and DC doing well. So people, people want to try new things when the established thing is doing well. So, for example... In the 1950s, the Justice League is doing well, so Marvel copy it and do the Fantastic Four, you know, and the Marvel Universe is born. Whenever Joe Quesada's Marvel was doing great, that's when guys like me came in with Kick-Ass and everything. We were able to capitalize on the fact a lot of people are going back into comic stores again and do creator owns. The brilliant Marvel period and DC period of the late 1980s led to the early 1990s creator owned explosion, you know. So you nobody wants to hear it, but you really want to get those Marvel fans back into comic stores again and get people excited about Marvel. And I think it's almost like, it's like us going back to our old school or something like that. You know, everybody needs to go back and do one or two projects, I think. And I, I'm going to try and get my friends to do this and over the next couple of years, try and get some excitement going back at the companies because there's a, obviously there's some great books. You know, there's two or three good books, I think, at, at DC right now, but you need 20 good books. You know, there needs yeah. to be... There needs to be 20 great books. And you go back and look at these other periods in history. Look at the noughties. Look at the 80s. Look at the 60s. There was so many books. I I mean, I was poor, right? So I couldn't afford them anyway, right? But there was so many books that I couldn't afford to buy all the books I wanted to buy. Exactly. And nobody's in that position anymore. Everybody's like, yeah, there's only two things worth (laughs) worth checking out. So like, let me get that variant cover that they already bought. Exactly. <laughs> so I think I, I want to see people. I want to see people in that position again, where they're holding twenty bucks in their hands, but they need sixty bucks for the number of good comics that came out that week. Yeah, mm-hmm. we haven't seen that in. Well, I, I think, in my opinion, I think the last time we saw that was when people like yourself and Ed brew baker and and brian were over over at marvel and turning a lot of books that you know had historically been good Mm -hmm. but were never you know really moving huge numbers um now they suddenly were i think that's the last time we really saw that i think it happens every alternate decade though i'm obsessed with history right and i've always always been right and i look at the trends in comics and I think that we, we have these 20 year waves, which we call ages. And everybody talks about the co- you know the copper age and the bronze age and all this. It's all nonsense, right? But the, the real the real ages is you've got the golden age, you get the silver age, you get the dark age. And then what I call the Hollywood age, right? There's a 20 year period of Hollywood, and now we're in the Japanese manga age, you know. So like uh, these are the these are the waves of, of comics. So like I think 1935, things like Crimson Avenger and those pre-Superman superheroes. You know, you have appearing around about 1935 to, broadly speaking, 1955. And that wave of creators, everything, you know, it just they belong to that time, which is the Golden Age. Then you've got the Silver Age, which is 55 through to 75. And 75, people think the Dark Age started in the 80s, but it actually started mid-70s, where guys like Steve Gerber, Don McGregor, and all that doing very realistic superhero stories like Defenders and... Uh, Marshall Rogers and Steve Englehart doing Batman and everything, you know, the very dark kind of stories, very unlike the Silver Age stuff. And these ages peak roughly in the middle, you know, so you so you you have like an amazing mid-60s, you have an amazing mid-80s, you know, um, and 
I think the Hollywood age started with Warren Ellis and Grant Morrison doing widescreen comics in the late 1990s, which looked like movies. It was the first time comics really properly looked like movies. But I think we've come to the end of that now. And it, it stopped. Things that have petered out around about 2013 to maybe 2015, but dead by 2015, I think, pretty much, you know. And I think what happened was the industry just started to import the way that the American car industry imported Japanese cars in the 1980s. I think they just have been importing Japanese comics, you know. So it's a, it's a very interesting place we're in right now, but we, we should be aware of it fiscally, what we are, you know. So with the Superman story, do you have an artist in mind? Or are, you, are you that oh, far yeah. along in the, in the pre-production? Well, because I'm on staff at Netflix, you know, like uh, I can't actually make any moves, but I've got about three guys who uh, I would want, you know, and there's the there's the kind of the one who will let me down, right? Is going to be <laughs> you know, the realistic <laughs> one, and so on, you know. So I've got about three guys. I'm uh, I've got in the back of my head, but I can't wait. I mean, I've been jotting down notes all the time, you know. I mean, I've I've got such enthusiasm for it. I mean, I, Superman's all I ever wanted to do, you know. So to get a second shot at it after Red Sun, you know, awesome. Well, also you had the project. I believe it was uh, you, Mark Wade, and a third writer that was, I guess, percolating at DC Comics and things eventually fall apart. Well, that was kind of before my big break. It was kind of late yeah. 1990s. Um, Authority was my big break. But just before it, um, we heard that Superman was kind of coming up for a bit of a reboot. They were feeling that the company that were going to bring in a fresh team. So we put in a pitch, and it was Mark Wade, Grant Morrison as the sort of two senior writers, and then Tom Pyre and myself were the sort of two junior guys that are coming in uh, to, to write one book too. Um, but I just, it just it got rejected. But to be honest, I'm kind of glad as well because I, I wanted to be at the peak of my powers when I'm doing Superman, you know, and I just, oh, yeah. I don't think I was ready, you know, like, you know, it's funny when you start out in the business, you kind of, you don't understand why you're not writing X-Men immediately. You know, you're <laughs> like, oh, well, I should be writing X-Men, you know. And then you realize, no, you have to learn your craft and take 10 15 years to get competent enough to be let like anywhere near an X book, you know? And I, I feel that like that with Superman, I wouldn't have done the best version of it if I'd done it when I was 29. You know, it's, uh, I'm glad I'm, I'll, I'll be doing this when I'm ready for it, I think. Do you think well, that's true these days? Yeah. Sorry, I had to ask yeah. that. Do you think that's true these days that you have to work up to X Men? <laughs> you should. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> I mean, it was on my mind too, you all. So you're not yeah. alone. Like, I don't want to like, put you like, on the like, spot. I, I wish that it was. It was still that way because I would like. You know, you would like to see the best talent on these characters. You know, you want to yeah. see people who have practiced their craft and who have really, you know, honed their abilities and and you know, really do, can dig into these characters and find something new about them. Even though yeah. so many stories have been told over time, and uh, I don't feel like that's that's what we currently get, and it's to the industry's detriment. Even cover artists had to earn it. Yeah, <laughs> like if Bill Sienkiewicz can draw a proper Moon Knight, they just got Frank Miller to do it instead. You know? Yeah. And it wasn't a guarantee that you were the artist inside that you're going to get the cover. You know, you have to earn it. <laughs> well, it, it was actually a training camp. Like when I started out, um, and it was the same in the states as well for decades. You start off in short stories. You start off doing four page stories, and you, I, you know, Alan Moore did that for two years, right? He did short stories for two years, little sci-fi shorts for 2008. But you know what it does? It teaches you, you know, that's your apprenticeship. Like, if you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a plumber, a, a carpenter, you have to learn. You know, you learn at the feet of masters and you practice and you make, do, you make mistakes and then you get good, you know, over time. And then what they used to do was they would have you in short stories. Then you were put on the books nobody read that were about to be cancelled, which was the case with me, you know. Uh, and that toughens you up as well, you know, because every month you can find out you're about to lose your job, which is kind of scary. You know, you're waiting <laughs> for and then you move from there into the books that's kind of more mainstream, but nobody's reading, you know. And, and then eventually you've done 10 years and, and you're ready for the big time. You know? And you I think see, it's good, good for the creators because it teaches you how to do your job. Did, I, uh, did you see that Howard Chaikin did a post about that? Where yeah. He's basically yeah. talking about how there's no internship anymore and people aren't, you know, supping at the feet of masters and stuff. Um, uh, no, everybody wants to get paid right now. <laughs> it's another thing, obviously. But I guess it's the pop idol, American idol society, isn't it? You know, like everybody wants to immediately be Adele, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, you, 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 you know, you can't become a millionaire immediately. You know, you have, you have to practice, you have to get good and, and I understand. I, I, the only thing I disagree with that is 
Chaykin, I think, is a genius who doesn't understand how important he is and how inspirational he's been to all of us, right? So, I mean, I discovered Howard Chaykin when I was, like, nine, and I never let go, right? So, like, in, in my teens, he was amazing. I used to try and draw like him and everything. And I, the only thing is, I think, when I read that, I felt sad because, one, it was the most truthful thing I've ever read, you know, like, just, it was just his feelings down on paper, which I thought was amazing. But... I don't think he realizes how brilliant he is. I, I was quite sad when I got to the end of it that he feels he's almost just kept his head above the water and contributed nothing mm -hmm. because it's not true. I mean, I think Chicken's one of the 10 giants. You know, I think he's, yeah. he's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of crazy the way uh, we have like an entire generation of, of people, uh, even younger than, than you, that are still really talented. They almost like they can't get any work anymore. So, so Mark, well, I know you're a big Superman fan. We know that we've got this big Superman thing coming out. This week was the 10-year anniversary of Man of Steel. Obviously, you love Superman. You've got the cape. You've got the cat. What is the best depiction we've ever gotten of the character? Oh, come on. It's Christopher Reeve's Superman the movie, of course. You it's got to be. Yeah, I mean, it's not even It's like not even open to argument. You know, like, uh, like uh, when, when anybody else comes in with any other opinion, I'm like, delete, block. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people will tell me, like, but what do you mean you don't like Superman Returns, but you like the original Superman and Superman 2? It's like, that movie is pales in comparison to both of those films. It doesn't do anything right. I bet that took two little kids to it. They were bored. He's, a, dead, no action. He's, he's a deadbeat dad in, in yes. Superman Returns. That's not Superman. <laughs> it's the weirdest movie. And at the end as well, when he, when he says to Lois Lane... He's realized this is his kid, right? This, and he says, to Lois Lane, <laughs> powers. Hey, listen, I'm not going to make any kind of commitment to you, but if you ever you know, want to hook up, I'm always around. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember the big, the big villain plot, obviously, for yeah. Lex Luthor was, I'm going to create a new continent made out of kryptonite where nothing can grow and no one can ever live, and I'm yeah. going to sell the real estate. <laughs> yeah. After I well, destroy, even my comic book standards, that was bad. <laughs> after I destroy the world's economy, so like, what is <laughs> what is the point? <laughs> I, my friend Fatal Jane's always throwing Superman Returns in my face, like I like yeah. it. Like you don't understand how much I don't like that movie because I do like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's got a couple of good moments. I like the um, you know that that plane sequence is really good. You know the mm -hmm. the, the fact they slowed it down and decompressed it so much, I thought was really cool. You know, where you're seeing inside the plane and all that, you know. But Superman the also... To the eyeball was cool. That was a cool moment. But other, I mean, everything else around that scene yes. is also boring. Who's going to find a bullet in Superman? He's been around for years at this point in the continuity, you know. Was, but remember, you, the can, you can empty an entire pistol into Superman and he'll yeah. stand there like, you know, you stupid bastard, I'm Superman. And yeah. then you'll, you, you, it runs out of bullets and you throw it at him and he'll duck. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best version of Superman we've gotten in comic books? Well, I think it's a bit like James Bond or Doctor Who. Like people always like the one they grew up with, and it's, it's the way it always happens. So my dad just they always say to me, "Oh, Sean Connery's the best James Bond," and I would be like, "Yeah, your mind, it's Roger Moore, you know." So it's whoever you loved as a kid, whoever you saw first. So for me, it's um, Carrie Bates, um, who it's crazy that he's less well known, you know, but he. Uh, He's written more Superman stories than anyone in history. You know, he started writing Superman when Lyndon B. Johnson was president. You know, <laughs> and, he, and he wrote it all the way up to me leaving high school. You know, and he he he's. I mean, I've been in touch with him recently. I interviewed with him, uh, interviewed him on my uh, podcast, and uh, yeah, he's amazing. He and Kurt Swan together is basically oh, yeah. my favorite thing from my childhood. You know, out of all pop culture, I, I absolutely love. Their, I really recommend their their Superman comics to anyone. I like the John Byrne Man of Steel just because it kind of recontextualizes the Clark Kent part of the Superman persona to being somebody that you could respect. Well, see, I don't know. See, I disagree because I think like the whole there's two there's two strains of thought on Clark Kent, right? So for me, Clark Kent is Superman's disguise, right? Because mm -hmm. even in the very first thing that was ever written in 1938. It said, who disguised as mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent, right? So Superman puts on glasses because he doesn't need glasses. He's disguising himself as Clark Kent, right? So, like, Clark Kent is this uh, slightly goofy persona that he adopts uh, so people don't think he's Superman. And I think what makes Superman really interesting is that he's one of the two characters who's primarily the superhero but dresses up as a person. There's only two characters in comic book fiction who do that. 
where they actually dress up as their secret identities. Most people, it's Peter Parker who puts on a Spider-Man suit, you know. And um, and I think what John Byrne did was he brought, and I love John Byrne, but I think he brought a Marvel head to it. He was like, oh no, Clark Kent's who I am, but Superman is what I do. And I think it misses the entire point of Superman because what makes him so interesting is that Clark Kent is a work of art. Clark Kent listens to country music. Clark Kent would be watching Yellowstone. You know, it's like Clark, Clark Kent is not Superman. You know, he's, he's an, an amazing piece of art that Superman invented, this fictional character, so that he can interface with normal people. Very nice. Let's hear it for the peoples. We do have some uh, super chats. People want to talk to Mark. Caleb says, to get it out of my system, James Gunn's an idiot and Jim Lee's getting J Jason Aaron. But on Gunn, do you think it is incompetence or just Hollywood? I, I'm amazed. I'm seeing so many people taking swings at James right now. And I love James, right? But I but I think what you have to remember is like, I see this a lot at work because I, I work in the studio, right? Like whenever you start working on something, people do not see the fruits of your labor for about four years, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's if all goes well, you know, sometimes there's hiccups. We COVID slowing us down and everything as well. So like, pardon me, James's work will not be seen until at least summer 2025. So we can't, we cannot judge anything right now. But what he is, is he's in charge of a studio that, that's made a $250 million investment here or a $120 million investment here. And he has to try and sell that to people. So he's he's got to say, hey, listen, this is awesome, you know, even if he doesn't believe it, you know. So I, I really sympathize with him because all he's trying to do is keep the ship afloat until he can get in there and hopefully make it better. Because, I mean, it's been it's been a mess, hasn't it? Yeah. He's not in a good spot. It's not an enviable place to be in. It's a, couple, it's a tricky couple of years, you know. It's, I mean, at least <laughs> yeah. the, the Joker, I think, will be amazing next year. And I think it will make a ton of money. So I'm hoping that boosts everything up because it reflects in all of us. I mean, Marvel movies have been terrible for five years, four years, you know. Uh, yeah. The TV shows are unwatchable, you know. So it doesn't help any of us. I mean, any of us who work in this game, you know, like that it, is detrimental. So I, I really root for even rival studios because the more people into this stuff, the better. The but, interest. But, the, but the real trouble is, I mean, the honest truth is there's only a certain number of people who are really good at doing this stuff, you know, like, like Matthew Vaughn is really good at doing this kind of thing. Sam Raimi's great at it. You know, um, Brian Singer was very good with the X Men and everything. But you're, you, it's a special personality that can do this stuff. It's not just anybody. You can't just do a soap opera and then come and do a superhero thing. They're really, really yeah. difficult to do. You know. So the trouble is, supply has absolutely outstripped demand, and it's outstripped the talent pool. I think right. as well. So, so people who are not brilliant are in charge of very expensive productions right now. I feel so, like um, every a lot of people took the lesson of what well, we were able to bring in the Russo brothers who, you know, prior to coming into to Marvel, their big claim was what some paintball episodes of community and, uh, arrested, arrested, development. and arrested yeah. development and yeah. make them into superhero movie directors. Um, and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Marcus and McFeely, they were not really known for writing superhero stories but they <laughs> did a pretty good job of it as well mm -hmm. um so i guess they took that lesson of well we can make anybody a and now you you're seeing it you're, you're, i think you're seeing it in the comic side with they can yeah. they feel like they can bring anybody in to write or draw the comics and now they feel like yeah. they can bring anybody in to write and direct the movies and tv shows and everybody's sitting there going this sucks but late i never said i'm oh, sorry but I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this, but this happened in the early 90s in comic books as well. Yeah. So what happened was the, the, the brands of X-Men and Spider-Man and so on were so enormous. And when Todd and Jim and Rob and everybody all left, they were kind of like, well, we can just, it doesn't matter. The brand is what's important here. So they brought in assistant editors, cousins of assistant editors and all that, you know, <laughs> were all writing these books. And it was garbage. And, and it took a couple of years. But the audience the, were like, we're not buying this anymore. And people blame the speculators, but the honest truth was the collapse of comics that happened around about 94, 95 was because there was a lot of people who weren't very good taking over titles that were previously brilliant. You know? And the same uh, thing has happened in, in so movies and as well. You're saying too much Scott Lobdell and Mark Bagley on comic books is what you're saying. <laughs> I'm not naming names of that name. Well, I said it then. <laughs> Lane wants to know, First, he says, man, Doc, Aaron, Mr. Miller, this must be a super deluxe uh, thinking critical. 
uh, presents comics aficionados. What question is a Starlight sequel mini possible? Um, I had an idea for one, but um, there's no urgency for it because everything we have at Netflix, Netflix bought my company a few years back, and Netflix um, have the rights to do everything except for Starlight. Starlight's actually over at Fox and Nemesis as well, but Nemesis will probably be back very soon. But Starlight's over at Fox, uh, which is now called 20th Century. And 20th Century are planning to do a movie of Starlight with Joe Cornish writing and directing. The script for it is amazing. Um, so if that happens, then that means it's going to be at 20th Century for quite a long time. So Netflix won't want me to write a sequel for a rival studio, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, so yes, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. Not, not, not in our lifetimes. I, I'm fascinated by the fact that somehow my name ended up in front of Mark's name here. <laughs> in, in this <laughs> comment. It doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> I, I, I love you, Lane, but Mark's definitely. It's not even a alphabetical. Guest. <laughs> Jacob Morningstar. Hello, guys, and welcome to the legend himself, Mark S. Miller. Absolutely. The man in the myth, the legend. Caleb says, John Kent by Tom Taylor. It reminded me of those parents that tell their kids the reason they're getting bullied is because they like them. It was a weird, that was a weird thing. Did you see that, Mark? No, no. Uh, so John Kent has ended up searching out <laughs> Ultraman, who basically kidnapped him and tortured him for seven years. Right. He goes to confront him. Injustice Superman shows up and kills him. And right. they end up in the Injustice universe. And John Kent realizes that this is like a neo-fascist version of his father. Right. That is hurting people simply because he can and people aren't free or whatever. And he breaks the arm of, I guess, the clone of his boyfriend on Earth. But in the Injustice universe, he powers up, his eyes like get electric, and then he runs up and hugs Injustice Superman as a way of fighting what he's done. Right. That's the I, big moment. I, I, I'm miles behind on uh, like DC stuff. I, I, I'm literally years behind on, you know. So what I do is I, I just pick up. I'm reading World's Finest. Green Lantern is excellent. Mm. I'm really liking that guy. The, the guy. He was doing The Flash for a little while. Now he's jumped over onto Green Lantern. which is Jeremy good. Adams. Excellent. Jeremy Adams. Yeah. yeah, it was really good. Uh, and one or two books. But honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm just – so, I know it sounds such a cop-out, but I'm so unaware. And at Marvel, I'm, I'm almost reading nothing, you know. And it's weird because I'm dying to read some stuff again. You know, like I'm reading a lot of back issues. I'm reading, I'm reading some manga, but I'm not really a manga guy. I want, to, I want to go and read some good Marvel and DC. You know, so it's not the best time in the world. But I wouldn't have suggest Adventures of Superman John Kent because he thought you fight evil with hugs, and I was like, it's a very hippie seventy thing outlook <laughs> for things. And I, I understand the perspective, what you're trying to say about the character, but. It's superhero comics. You got you end up having to fight fire with fire a little bit. In fairness, most Marvel comics ends with somebody beating them with the power of friendship these there's days. A lot so. of, <laughs> there's a lot of Care Bear stares going on. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 blame, uh, I blame Steven Universe for this whole, you know, everyone is defeated with the power of friendship and everyone is misunderstood. And, and uh, every every villain has a heart of gold. You know, if you just look, you look deep enough, uh, you know, it's it's a nice thing in the real world to expect the best of everybody and, and to think that maybe you can break through to them. And I think that we should have that in the real world, but in our fiction, I don't, I don't think it's particularly compelling when you do it over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely want to give a shout out to Blake Northcott, who's in the, who's in the chat. So welcome back to the channel. Calum says he's done, but he's not really done. No, I can already see he's got something else. Lade says to Aaron, I've been reading some dark wing duck picked up issue number six. Unlike Superman, after it was done, I had a smile and chuckled. It's dub, sort of fun. Thank you, thank you. I really, I appreciate you checking it out. Yeah, we had a lot of fun on that book. It's a shame that uh, that Dynamite wanted to go in a different direction because uh, we, James and I, really would have loved to have completed our story. But uh, you know, maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do it on our own. You know, as as free fanfic. You know, because I, I I'd like to get that story out of my system before uh, before I die. <laughs> before it dies. Cal wants to know, Mister Miller. What are your opinions of the Super Crooks anime on Netflix? Oh, I loved it. I thought it was really good. And it was weird because it was in Japanese, right? You know, so I, I, my, my involvement was almost zero on it. Um, but I'm usually quite heavily involved in things. But, um, but yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, I was just watching it as a fan. And Studio Bones are amazing. I mean, they really are at one of the best animation houses in, in Japan. Um, so it was, it was kind of weird watching something that you created becoming Japanese and you know, in a language you don't speak and everything. It was, it was really cool. It was like somebody adopting your baby and your baby coming back as Einstein speaking German or something. You know? 
Jose B says, good morning to you all. And of course, the legendary Mark Miller. I believe you are the best writer today. You will give me faith in comics again. Any ideas which artists you would like to do your Superman story? So I guess I sort of stole his uh, his question <laughs> there. Stole, but... stole his thunder. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jose to Bees. I mean, but you are the best there. writer in comics today. How did this happen, Mark? You it stepped was... away, and now you step back, and you're you're at the top of your game. The, maybe the bottom is just low. I don't know. You know, like it seems. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, there should be some twenty eight year old guy coming through and cleaning the floor with me though you know so i mean I, but as a reader i want to see that you know i want i want to see 10 new guys appear who are just amazing you know and i think i think we're due it you know like every 20 years or so there's a kind of washing out of the old and then some new people bursting through and and i'm a fanboy more than anything so i want to see that i want to see some people that i've never seen before doing this in a way i've never seen and I, but it has to be cool i want it to be exciting you know like I want, I want to see some badass comics again. It's been a long time since I've seen something kind of badass, you know, which is weird. Have you seen anything interesting uh, like that? Because I, I that's the my biggest lament. I know a lot of people are looking for uh, stability and just really solid stuff, but I'm looking yeah. for the stuff that everybody hates that you're going to say 10 years later, oh my God, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Um, is there Purgatorio anybody like that right was now? kind of like that, right, Mark? You know, I this was an Alan Moore, Kevin O'Neill comic I didn't even know existed, right? And, <laughs> and I really, I love Alan Moore, right? But I somehow missed this book. And I was just in a bookshop with my kids two weeks ago, and I and to come across it, how can I describe it? It's like it's like finding there was a movie between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi that you missed. <laughs> and what the Thanksgiving <laughs> special? Well, but I got home. I just read it. I loved it. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> but yeah. So I mean, I, I want to see some badassery again. For me. When I was a kid, right, when I was in high school, some of my friends uh, were sort of borderline comic fans, and I used to show them maybe a page from Dark Knight Returns, like a cool scene, and I'd show them something from Frank Miller's Daredevil or a cool thing that Alan Moore had done, and they were like, oh, my God, that's so badass. I've never seen anything like that, you know? And I think we're kind of missing that, you know? Like, that sounds crazy, but teenage boys especially love that stuff. Like a badass moment. When was the last time you saw a badass moment in a comic and I, I think the closest thing to that that I've read lately that's kind of off the beaten trail maybe is Nottingham with uh, David is on, I think, is the writer, and Shane Connery Volk's the artist. It's like oh, something people that. really the talk show. about. Is it good? Yeah. I haven't, I haven't oh, yeah. It. that was, It's like a reimagining, obviously, of Robin Hood, where Robin yeah. Hood's the bad guy. Right. And uh, well, I guess it was a good it, twist. I never actually thought of that because he's essentially stealing from people, isn't he? I mean, that's yes. <laughs> the sheriff is the good guy. <laughs> so one, of, one of my kids made this great point. We were watching uh, Tom and Jenny, right? And one of my kids said, hang on a minute. Tom's just trying to defend his home. And this mouse <laughs> you know, trying to steal from the family every day. You know, it's like, <laughs> and I never actually considered it like that. No, even as a kid, I thought Jerry was an asshole. I was like, wait a minute. Tom's just trying to sing to his girlfriend. And this mouse just keeps jumping in and messing with it. <laughs> Ideator says, all star pale today. Huge fan of Mark Miller's work. Is there any Starlight adaption coming? Adaptation coming? Sounds like possibly from, from Century Fox or 20th Century uh, yep. Studios, but, but not from Netflix. Yeah. Also, your body of work is what makes the industry good. Love and big game. Oh, very kind. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So how much say would you have in something like a, the Starlight movie if it comes out? You get to see the script, but you don't like uh, get any creative oversight or maybe they bought the rights from you earlier? Uh, what happened was they, they bought the rights um, just before, about six months before I sold the company to Netflix, the Millimoral company. So it meant that Netflix, it's kind of like Fox and um, Marvel when it got bought by Disney. So Marvel owned the X-Men and Fantastic Four IP, Disney owned the IP, but it's over at another studio. So it's kind of like that. And I'm a Netflix staffer. I'm an exec at Netflix. So it means that um, I can't actually work on it. But my friend runs the studio and my friend is writing and directing the project. So I feel it's in really great hands, you know. There you go. Absolutely. I just saw in the comments, always hated Jerry. And somebody <laughs> said, Thomas Fagg. Tom is finally getting some justice. Misunderstood <laughs> <laughs> guy. Geyser Soze says, or Jose says, kick ass is the best uh, Marvel, non Marvel superhero ever made. Oh, cool. Do you know, it's I, I a more uh, kind of weedy version of Spider Man. He doesn't have the powers, but he's got the, uh, he's got all the, the, the responsibility with it, right? 
Well, no powers, no responsibility, you know, so it was was the kind of gag for it. But the uh, Spider-Man was absolutely my template. That's why I made him 15 years old, you know, and, and it has, when you look at the first volume in particular, it's got very much a Steve Ditko Spider-Man vibe, that real sewing your costume up and everything, just living with your aunt and everything, you know. So it was a very unglamorous Spider-Man, the Steve Ditko one, where the later Spider-Man's a lot more glamorous. And I always loved that. There was something really romantic about that idea of a kid who loves superheroes so much that he made his own costume went out there. It just felt like classic Peter Parker. Mm. Absolutely. That's an amazing movie. Jet, uh, Jet Keeg. Hey, Bark. Red Sun is my favorite Superman story. I've read it four times. Loving ambassadors. Keep up the good work. Oh, cool. Thank you. I hope that guy is called Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> is it Jedi or is it Jedi? Either Jedi way. Kai. Jedi Kai. Either way. <laughs> Caleb. Also, James Gunn liking Kelly Sue's story was uh has that guy read the actual oh never mind. The, the actual book. You can say the word, it's all right. Uh, the tampon book. I'm sure that he read it. And there is some amazing film in his art, especially in that first Agreed. issue. Doc and I reviewed it. It's a little bit over rendered, but it's absolutely spectacular. But um I don't know. Once you start messing with other people's mythologies, it just does the works for me. I think Phil Jimenez is a really cracking artist. Like he, mm -hmm. it's insane the level of detail he does. Like George Perez is obviously his mentor, you know. But like uh, I kind of, as a kid, I used to lose myself in George Perez pages, you know. And it's Phil. I think Phil's got the potential to be that, you know. He Absolutely. really has. I love it. Stuff. Rate that seven. I prefer Burn Superman. It makes more sense for Clark to be who Superman really is, since he was raised on Earth. It makes him more relatable. Let me tell you why that's wrong, right? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> right, Clark, Clark Kent, like, think about it like this, right? And I know people are going to take this the wrong way, but imagine you're a cat, right? And you get sat among a bunch of mice and they dress you up as a mice, mouse and they put mouse ears on you and everything, right? You're still a cat. So Superman's a Kryptonian. He was raised by the Kents. He's been given this amazing morality. He's got the nicest parents in the world. He's turned out the best guy and everything. But he has a different species. He's from somewhere else. So he he hears things on the other side of the planet. He can see under your skin and he can see microbes on your body and so on. It's like his view of the world is completely different. He's not Clark Kent. Clark Kent's a, a small town boy going to the big city, hoping to meet a great girl and everything, you know, and have a good job. That's not who he is. That's who he dresses up as. But Superman just sees the world in ways we can't imagine. So, of course, that's not Superman. Yeah. School to everybody. Ideator, <laughs> don't read the comics is why movies are bad. Oof. I, I, know, I think I know what this means. But does he mean that the people who work on the comic, uh, the movies now are not? Yes, comics? don't read the comics to get prepared for the. I 100% agree with this because I see this a lot. You know, I mean, I remember in my day job, I talked to a lot of people who work in other studios and everything, you know. And I, I think the minute the comic book movie started to tumble, is when the people started to become dismissive of the material. So mm -hmm. Marvel, for example, they used to have a brain trust of Joe Quesada and, uh, you know, Brian Bendis and those guys, you know, they, Ed Brubaker, you know, they, they'd have a whole bunch of people in to look at the scripts and give notes and everything. And then they just decided we don't need these guys anymore. These guys in an irritation, you know, and they sort of moved them on and they, they hired a bunch of guys who worked on Ali McBeal or whatever the hell, you know, so just people who worked <laughs> on regular <laughs> television shows, you know. And like, and they, they didn't have a love of it. And I think that the fundamental ingredient to making this stuff work and what makes it makes it really different from the stuff that came pre-1999, the comic book movies that get made, other than Tim Burton's Batman and Richard Donner's Superman, comic book movies were generally not very good because they were made by people who didn't respect the source material. But then Sam, Sam Raimi came in who adored Spider-Man you had Brian Singer who came in and found his take on X-Men and read every X-Men comic he could. Christopher Nolan read every single issue of Batman since 1939 before he started the script. He just immersed himself in Batman. So you had people who absolutely adored the source material, so they brought a level of respect to it, you know? Um, and I think you have people at the moment, unfortunately, who just see it as a gig and they, and they make, make fun of it. And I think... If audiences feel that the writers and the uh, the directors aren't taking it seriously, why the hell should they pay ten or twenty bucks to go and see this? Yeah, it I feels think, like uh, you've, you've got the 
it's like we've come full circle from like the 90s where people would be like hey do you like king shark and we'd be like yeah and they'd be like well we're gonna put him in a movie and you'd yeah. be like cool and they'd say and he's a gangster and you're like all right and, they'd say, and he wears a shark skin he's just a guy in a shark skin suit and you'd be yeah. like well that's not that's not really and they'd be like and he rides a motorcycle and you'll be like okay and, and it travels through time and you're like this isn't king shark <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so we've come full circle you know, to, we, we've gone from that to some really the Super Mario Bur Brothers movie, the original one. You know, yes. oh, <laughs> this yeah. doesn't bears no resemblance to the actual Super Mario Brothers. No. De De Dennis I, Hopper. I did want to ask Mark because sometimes it's not the writers themselves that are dismissing it; it's it's the producers telling the writers, "Don't read this." Yeah. And and do you think that's strictly just them trying to say like, "Hey, we don't want you to get too caught up in trying to specifically tell the story." Uh, almost like insulting their intelligence of you. You're not going to understand. You're not going to be able to separate the core meaning from the actual narrative plot line. Or do you think it's just them trying to be like, we are better than this? I, I think it's very simply just people who are not fans. So, for example, at Marvel, you had Kevin Feige, who was a huge comic book fanboy. So he would always say to them in interviews, um, and you can check this, by the way, check mm -hmm. any interview from the first 10 years of Marvel movies and the DVD extras, and they're, they're desperate to suck up to the fans. Everybody's like, well, all we want to do here is respect the material. Same as Lord of the Rings, you know, like, and the and the extras at the back of the DVDs, they're saying, well, what's important to us is pleasing the fans. You know, they say that all the time, and they were coached to say that, you know, so that they were, I mean, that's the most hardcore base that's going to go out there and make people feel good about your stuff. But then people who come in with Feige, you know, sort of around them and so on, who had zero interest in it. It was a gig on their way to another gig. So they would openly, I, I would see interviews, them, I was open mouth, where they would say, oh, I don't read the books, you know, I'm not interested in this kind of thing. And that's contagious. And I, sh I shouldn't mm -hmm. say contagious, it's infectious, because what it did was it created a culture of people who didn't respect the core material. And didn't seem Very to nice. want to either. Yeah. Uh, Jog Tall says, Mark, what is the status on the live action adaptation of your reborn comic on Netflix? They, they got Sandra Bullock. Um, Sandra Bullock's a producer on it, and there's been a screenplay, a couple of screenplays written, but they just weren't quite right. And I'd say my main job, because um, when I when I sold the company, I took a job at Netflix, and what I do is I basically essentially try and stop things from happening if, if it doesn't look good, you know? So, like, if something isn't quite right yet, my big thing is let's go back and try this again. Um, and if it has to happen 10 times, it happens 10 times, you know, like... Because it's too easy to bring out something that's not good, and then it just destroys, you know, that particular property, you know. And and it happens sometimes, you know. But you but you really try your best to try and make sure it doesn't. So um, it's just not there yet, you know. And I and I'm lucky I can stop things happening until they're right. You know? Yeah. Very nice. Wraith X Seven. One of the reasons why my adventures with Superman cartoon is so good and popular is because Clark is relatable and flawed. All I can say is. Superman, in the, when it was done the way I would suggest, you know, 1950s, 1960s, up to the 70s, was the biggest cultural icon on the planet. Now it's not, you know. <laughs> is is that show popular? Like I, 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 I am aware of it. You know, I know it exists, but I don't, I, I don't really. I mean, at least nobody in my circle is raving about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard it. It's definitely targeted more towards the younger audience. Uh, I had one of my friends who's a writer say that that it's ultimately a decent show, but it is very clearly for that that level. So yeah, although I, I haven't watched it, but I do think one thing that's really important is getting kids into Superman again. You know, and kids yeah. into DC characters. I don't know if you guys watched the Teen Titans show. You know, the cartoon Teen Titans. Teen Titans Go is what I'm watching with my yeah. with my four year old. He loves it. My, my two youngest kids are obsessed with it, right? Obsessed with yeah. it. And to me, this feels like the great untapped DC franchise in terms of movies. I mean, I'm amazed James Gunn didn't put that in his first lineup because mm. them, you know the way the X-Men cartoon in the, the early 90s paved the way for the fans to be into X-Men in the year 2000? Mm -hmm. Teen Titans has been doing all the heavy lifting for DC. Like Everybody mm. loves the Teen Titans cartoons. The serious cartoon was great, and the comedy version is also great. They're both absolutely brilliant. So like, uh, but I, I'd love to see more stuff that my kids can watch because the DC animated stuff, I think is a little dark, you know, like my kids, yes. can't really especially get the it. movies. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, mean, I, I want to love that stuff, but like, but my kids are a bit freaked out by it. They don't like it. 
Yes, <laughs> Eric O'Sullivan. The Sultan of Soup. Yeah, I miss pretty much all of Alan Moore's image work. 1963 is a love letter to atone for the damage he did with Watchmen. I did he do damage with Watchmen? I mean, I would say he did, but he didn't mean to. I think it's not his. Was... It's not his fault that everybody said, "Oh, that's what comics are supposed to be." After yes, he did agreed. It. Alan Moore doesn't know how to put a fire out in a uh, forest. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remember what what Alan Moore was was he was essentially you know the physicist who came up with the idea of splitting the atomic bomb, and everybody else was the people who started dropping the bomb on people. You know, <laughs> like, you know yes. something absolutely brilliant. And everybody else did the worst possible versions of it. So, like, <laughs> Watchmen on its own and is a distinct thing, is an amazing piece of work. But all the imitators have kind of sullied it a little bit. Uh, I think, I think you ended up with a lot of people that end up coming into the industry that think they are Alan. Yeah. Uh, they think they can imitate him, and it's like a baseball player coming in. Everybody thinks that they're Barry Bonds. In fact, they're just some guy that barely made it out of triple triple A. Yeah. Um, and and they keep swinging for the fences, keep striking out. I'll be honest, Doc. Confused. Mark's Mark's uh, analogy is way better than yours. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it really, really is. Doc it like is it was perfect. To... But same with Frank Miller's Batman. I remember Miller's Batman came out in 1986, 87, and I'd never seen anything like it. Like Fred, I was still at high school at the time, and I was giving copies of it to my friends to read. Like, the, mm. the copies I still have now in the house are so thumbed, you know, they're almost destroyed mm -hmm. because all of my friends read it, guys who didn't read comics, they loved it. But what you had, unfortunately, after that was about 1988, 89, you had really sub-Frank Miller copycat guys doing Batman who missed the humor that Miller brought, the wit that he brought to it, and the intelligence and so on. So now when people think of grim and gritty, they think of the, the pale imitation instead of the genius that Miller brought with Year One and, and Dark Knight Returns. So I think Moore has the same problem, or you know, people think of realistic dark comics of the late 1980s and forget that the first one was actually a work of genius. Death metal hero Mark, I worked in my childhood LCS for almost a decade, and your comics were often my go to recommend for old fans returning to comic skull, sir. Ah, thank this you. He's having a drink. <laughs> Very nice. Yes, sir. Good. <laughs> uh, nerd says, Sorry, I'm late on making all my promise. Uh, thanks for reading fake, uh, fake red doc. I had oh, Doc yeah. read Spider-Man Fake Red, which is a manga, and it turns out it's the best Spider-Man comic we've read in five years or so. Oh, everybody told me that was amazing. I never saw it, but I heard it was great. It it is um, uh, to the point like um, I I have not bought a new comic book in like two years now, and I went out and bought that. Wow! Hmm. Oh, is it available to buy? Yeah, you could buy it. They the, they have it in trade format. Or, you know, like Tonkabon or whatever the hell the format is for yeah, manga. manga. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, there's, I think there's two volumes of it. Um, I, I bought volume one. Um, haven't found, I haven't finished it yet to go buy in volume two. I can I love that. So Marvel, Marvel see no money out of this at all? Then? I don't believe I think so. they paid them to make the book, maybe. All oh, right, right. I thought this was a, a proper bootleg thing that people were just selling a like, comic. No, no, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's available on like Shonen Jump and stuff like that. Oh, that's kind of disappointing because uh, I I was hoping it was just some guys were selling this. Out of <laughs> <laughs> Spider Man than Marvel, <laughs> like uh, John Byrne doing with X Men. <laughs> Thirty two rumor years. about Steve Ditko. There's an amazing rumor kicking about for years that Steve Ditko, when he left Spider Man, you know, in 1965 or whatever, that Ditko went off and just kept writing and drawing spider-man stories and there was 300 issues that he never that he wrote did himself yeah and i don't know <laughs> oh, I love the idea, you know? there's no be way amazing. that happened right <laughs> uh if there's, if there's anybody in the comic industry that i think would be that like stubborn and be like nope i'm doing what i want it it, it would it would be dead co i um, mean he yeah. he pretty much kept doing the question when he did mr a stories but yeah. <laughs> isn't, there, isn't there an urban legend about like kids finding out that Steve Ditko, you know, worked on Spider-Man that he lived in their neighborhood and they went to, you know, went to visit him and he gave them drawings of Spider-Man. And when they looked on the back, it was cut up boards of like his original ASM pages. Like oh he just still God. had those and he was just cutting them up and using them for scrap. 
that's yeah. amazing. I love yeah. that. that. That sounds real. I think that sounds real too. <laughs> yeah. 32 flavors of Nick Weiser. Hello, panel of dudes and Mark. Mr. Miller, which format do you think best suits an adaptation for Huck? Movie, show, animated, live? Regardless, I'm enjoying the reread of my life. Well, we, we're actually um, developing a live action uh, series of it right now. So, like, uh, we tried it as a movie and this, it just didn't work. It felt like a Superman knockoff when it was a movie, you know, but like, yeah, uh, we thought as a show, there's just a take on it, you know, that we're, we're developing just now. So, it's that script stage. We're just seeing how it's coming together. Very nice. Sounds like he's already got it planned out. Student of God. Mark, are you following Eric July? Have you read I Song? I haven't read the book because I'm like, this is going to sound crazy, right? Like, I can't, I, I've got a cell phone that's from 2007. Right, so it's the only cell phone I have, and it's never charged up, and it's always lying in a drawer, right? So nobody can ever get in touch with me. So like, and I've never ever bought anything on Amazon ever, you know. So like, yeah. uh, so, so I'm really technically illiterate, um, and I think the only way I can get ISIM is if I buy it online. I, I, I think I he's got that. his own website for e-commerce, yeah. But see. one one day I will because I love what he's doing. I love the fact that he's so so bold and you know he's just out there doing his thing and like i just love it when i love it when a creator has success you know because it's really weird but in a strange time just now here's i'll tell you a quick weird story like one of my kids really loves going to like costa and starbucks and things and i'm like don't go to these places go to the little independent coffee house because they need mm -hmm. your money these big stores don't need it and she said to me no but i love i love the brand you know i, I, I love these places and i was like always support the little guy and We've got a kind of weird flip in culture just now where people kind of weirdly support brands and corporations. You know, they love Marvel, you know, but they don't support the little guy, you know. So my generation of guys, we grew up loving the little guy, you know. So so for me, guys like Eric July taking on the corporations is really exciting. And the fact that he's taking them on and be more profitable than Spider-Man or X-Men or Batman or whatever, I, I just think is awesome. So I, I total admiration for him. Absolutely. Caleb says, I thought Jerry was a girl like Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> really weird. <laughs> SW says, sitting in the Saudi desert and just finished Ambassadors. Cheers, Mark, for making me almost piss myself laughing from Australia's fight of revelations. That is definitely the standout character, Mark. <laughs> no, he's pretty fun. He's pretty fun, the Australian one. Like, uh, I think, it, hang on, somebody just said Mark's voice sounds like John Cleese. What the <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he has an accent. <laughs> hell, guys? That's because of Sean Connery screwing everything up for people. You know, we <laughs> we look at Keanu Reeves and go, that guy can't do a British accent. But Sean Connery can't do a Russian accent or a Spanish accent or all the stuff he's done, right? Well, you know so, what everybody forgets is that it's all a matter of perspective. See, Mark doesn't have an accent. We all have accents. Exactly. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, that's it's just where you're from. And everyone else has an accent. You're, you're, you speak correctly, and everyone else has an accent. <laughs> Do you know, John Cleese was one of my neighbors a couple of years ago. We were playing strangely like that. And I'll, I'll tell you a strange, a strange thing. He used, he used to live next door to a hotel, right? So he was right next door to a hotel. And he used to always phone the hotel and ask for room service. <laughs> and they would say, but you're not actually in the hotel. And he said, yeah, but it's only another 10 feet. So could you <laughs> just bring, bring me some food, you know? And he did it every night, tried to get his dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I, I, Come on, Josh, say brilliant. something. I know. I, well, I was just going to say, style. like, it, I, for me, finding out that John Cleese lived next door to you, I just kind of feel like there needs to be a running gag now that you've got background characters in every one of your books, and then they're just telling John Cleese stories. So one time John Cleese came over, you know, and just <laughs> run with it. It's like a little Easter egg that's in I, I was in the hotel actually one time, and they said to me that John Cleese came in with a cat on a lead, you know, like a dog lead kind of thing, came in with a cat on a lead. And he said, look, I'm going on holiday for a week. Would you mind looking after my cat while I'm gone? And they had to get <laughs> He sounds a real character. <laughs> <laughs> Lane wants to know, oh, Mr. Miller, I do wish we could get a follow ultimate comic or ultimate comic follow ultimate Hulk versus ultimate Freddie Prince Jr. That felt unresolved for the <laughs> ultimates. <laughs> Who? Don't I you remember like the Freddie right? Prince Jr. jerk <laughs> in the ultimates? You Guys, you update I... You would have to update the Freddie Prinze part these days for a newer audience, I think. 
I don't think it's culturally revel- relevant anymore. Unless you're yeah. like I, I kind of like that though because when I was a kid, we used to in the 1980s we used to read 1960s Marvel comics in Scotland because they would package them in black and white cheap reprints, you know. So all the all the references were out of date. So they'd be talking about the Ed Sullivan show and everything. I'd be like, who the hell is that? <laughs> I, I, I kind of like that idea that Marvel Comics was really immediate and it was just talking about the world you were in. And next year it was out of date. So I purposely peppered all my Marvel stuff with references to, you know, just what people were into in 2004, you know? Like, like <laughs> the as, as current year as you could possibly be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I actually have to bounce. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, love your work and really appreciated this conversation. I look forward to catching the rest of it. Well, uh, great to see you. I, I have to do the same, actually. Like, like I said, we just moved house this week. So all my wife's friends are, are literally walking around the house and, like, checking it out. <laughs> like, and so like uh, so I have to go back and see them. I, I promised them I said I'll just be an hour and I'll I'll jump back and see them all. I, I've I've tanked about three bottles of wine and God knows how many beers though, you know. So like <laughs> I, I feel I'm I'm not fit to go back and join normal people again. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to stay here with the nerds as long as you like, sir. <laughs> oh, this has been brilliant. I mean, you know I listen, Wes, I listen to the show every day. I, I mean, I think you, your boy, Perch, um, you know, uh Clownfish is very good, you know, Critical Drinker, Nedrotic, great, you know. There's so many great podcasts, you know, just waiting for great comics, you know, like, uh, but I do, I check it every day and I'm amazed that you, I think, it's funny, I was talking to a friend this morning actually and I was saying, I think you've even hit a new level with this, the, the the channel, just now. I'm loving it, I think that your, your stuff's so insightful, please keep doing it, don't stop doing it. You know? Well, thank you very much. Tabby wants to know, have you seen the Battle of the Super Sons movie? No. No. Your kids would like that. <laughs> I didn't even know there was one. Was it like uh, was it a straight to DVD kind of thing, or what, what? What was that? I don't think it was. I think it went straight to Max. It's you know, it's obviously a young John Kent, young Damian Wayne uh, right. on their adventures, yeah. kind of more in line with Super Sons and what they're. Doing. Oh, that sounds cool because I mean, those comics were great. I love those. Oh, comics. Excellent. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, I think you would enjoy it. Was it Peter Tomasi writing those ones? Because he's really good. Yes. I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. 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 That was a really nice run. That was good stuff. Yeah, that was one of the big losses with Bendis coming up to oh. Superman. Right. I really liked how you redeemed Anton Arcane in your Swamp Thing run. That scene was amazing. You had some great ideas during that run with the par- the, par- the the parliaments. That should have been a deeper look. Uh, that should have been looked into deeper. Well, I'm, I'm just pleased anyone remembers it. You know, like uh, I was only in my early 20s at the time. That was 30 years ago, you know, so it was like, uh, but I'm pleased if he enjoyed it. That's wonderful. Yeah. Man, you know what's crazy with Swamp Thing? He's almost like the daredevil of DC Comics where every time somebody gets all that book, they do some of the best work of their life mm. somehow. Do you know, that's a great observation because, I mean, Daredevil's had like maybe five excellent creative teams, you know, it's, yes. which is unheard of, especially for us, a bc less character like Daredevil. And you're right, Swamp Thing's the same. Like there's, I mean, Brian Vaughn did a run on it that, you know, people don't know, you know, there's been really great guys. Uh, always done done one thing. I don't. I think sometimes once you've had three or four great people, it attracts other people to come in and want to do the character, doesn't it? Like Daredevil would have been a hard sell in 1975, you mm. know. But but now everybody has a Daredevil story they want to tell. I think I think it's a little safer for some to be able like get the approval to experiment on. You yeah. Know, with it with like a, a Spider Man because he was so strong out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's it's difficult to get, you know, you you're under a lot more of a microscope. Whereas yeah. Daredevil, it's more of an experimental character anyway. There's so many weird things about it. Yeah, and and the fact that he did flounder, kind of mm-hmm. for his first good number of years, they couldn't really oh. get a, a direction for him. Just a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. From the early sixties until the late seventies, there wasn't really any great Daredevil stories. Really, you know. But then yeah. Frank Miller just came in and uh, he made it. He went from nowhere to it being Marvel's number one book, which is insane. I mean, imagine someone pulled that off now, took a book that nobody was reading and made it the number one book. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Jose to Beast. Hello, Mark. What are your thoughts on Mark Wade's Superman birthright and Jeff John's Secret Origin? Um, I, I haven't read Secret. I mean, I love Jeff John's, but I haven't read Secret Origin. What, what one was that? He it, means the Legion. Like- Gary yeah, Frank was, does the art. 
And then he does Brainiac, which shows you him meeting the Legion, and it has Gary Frank Hart. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen that. It was really well done because it's from a different angle each time, and the dialogue's yeah. the same. I love that right. bit. The Superman birthday, I remember really enjoying, though, and it was it was really beautifully colored. I always remember Lanil use art on it was great, and the coloring was amazing. It was a, a great-looking book, really good book. And I think underrated. I think people don't talk about it enough. It's a really, it's a really nice break. But sorry, guys, I better bounce as well. Like yep. I can hear everybody talking downstairs, and I think food's going out. So there's no way I'm missing. <laughs> oh, that. This is time no, to go. go, go get that stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mark Miller, for joining us today. Absolutely oh, uh, amazing stuff. An adaptation of American Jesus, the chosen one, out right now as well on uh, Netflix. We're delighted. We're number three in the world just now, so we're really happy with mm. that. You know, so. Congratulations. Long, long may it continue, though. So everybody check it out, you know, like because uh, you need those numbers to run for the whole month before you get season two. Yes, Absolutely. do it, because I'm still disappointed about um, Jupiter's legacy not, not being able to get continued. I don't want to repeat of that. Let's Everybody, no. go watch. The, the numbers, uh, what I love about Hollywood, actually, is the numbers never lie, you know, so people are into mm. it or they're not into it. You know, so like... Uh, you know, but we want the numbers for this. We, we'll get some great plans for season two and season three, you know, so check it out. It's on Netflix right now. If you go, it's uh, The Chosen One. Should be about, in America, it's about number five, just now globally about number three. So you should find it on your kind of what's trending. You know? Absolutely. Nice. Cool. Listen, guys, all the best and great seeing you. Have me back sometime, please. Absolutely. We'll have you on here and talk some more geek with us. Cool. Oh, yeah. All the best. Later, brother. Thank you, Mark. Bye Thank then. You. Wow. Well, that was awesome. That was awesome. He's like the nicest guy in the world. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to have a problem with the accent. The accent. <laughs> because I've, I've heard he was pretty good. Like, I think alcohol actually helps him because I I've agree. heard other interviews. I didn't know what the fuck he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know. Like, if I don't Which, listen to all of a Mark Miller conversation, it's only because I don't understand it. <laughs> we do have a lot, lot more questions for Mark. Obviously, he wasn't able to answer all of them. We will do our best that we can to get through all these and answer your questions. It won't be quite as good as Mark, but we'll do our best. Uh, Devil Eyes, uh, last time I saw you was at Jetpack pr promoting cro uh, Chrononauts with Sean Ruby. Still have the poster frame. Anyway, and what's the plan for the death of Cordelia Moonstone? Spoilers. That's a $10 spoiler. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, this would obviously we wouldn't even be able to speculate uh, w without Mark here, but I'm glad that you liked the book, and I I hope he was as cordial and friendly to you when you got to meet him at uh, when he was promoting Chrononauts at Jetpack as he was here. Uh, Pika Shades, I reviewed Superman Red Sun earlier this year on my channel and found some interesting things to criticize it, but I pra praise the neutrality that made it a story without a good guy and a bad guy. Was there no bad guy? I kind of thought that was like a, a bad version of uh, of Superman. And I was I was actually rooting for terrorist Batman. You know, there's a problem with Red Sun that people don't like to talk about, and it's that Dave Johnson didn't do the entirety of the art. Is that was Dave Johnson, right? Oh, I could it's be wrong. Been so long. Since I, I know exactly. Oh, wow. It's been so long since I read that. I guess Same. we should uh, do a, a show rewatch some reread some. Josh, were you rooting for terrorist Batman over communist Superman? I was. Yeah, I kind of was. I'm not gonna lie. I, I mean, but is, is it really out of Batman. character for me to root for Batman? Yeah, uh, let's, exactly. Okay, time out. Ignoring the past year and a half, is it really out of character for me to root for Batman? Like, I understand that Superman's not really portrayed in a bad light. He's obviously comes from a different point of view or whatever, but I was still rooting against it. Dirty commies always lose. <laughs> Carlos8560, um, Mr. Miller, big fan of yours since Kick-Ass recently finished Nemesis, reloaded, and loved it. What is the Magic Order show coming out? I do not know that answer, but I can tell you Magic Order Volume 4, Number 6 came out this week. Did anyone else read it beside myself? No, I haven't finished it yet. In it's fact, absolutely amazing. Can I give it? you some spoilers? Yeah, go. Well, yeah, I think you can. I, I don't want to spoil it for you because the ending is so good on it. This is what I think is better about Mark Miller in 2023 than like Mark Miller in, in even like 2000, 2005. Yeah. Is he doesn't really subvert your expectations. Mm -hmm. You basically get where you're supposed to get, but he never gets you there how you expected it. It's always in a way that you didn't even imagine possible that yeah. makes it even better than what you anticipated to begin with. He's like the talented M. Night Shyamalan. 
<laughs> yes. I I appreciate the books that he does that I like. The other ones I don't read. And it's just because it's not my style, you know. So uh, that's the thing I really appreciate about Mark Miller is that he has so he he has a diverse. He doesn't have a one story, one yeah. style. He's not like one speed he's like a, a Tom guy. King or a Scott Snyder or James Tynan, where it's kind of the same beats, the same rhythm, the same story over and over again. I would like to see his version of a Tom King therapist story. Now that would be better. <laughs> I think at the end. You know, the, the hero would probably be a better person, would, would grow. Probably. It's get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Caleb says, uh, don't read it. She-Hulk was a massive middle finger. Secret Invasion has the same in MODOK and Ant-Man 3. Yep. Oh, you don't have to sell me on the MC sucks right now. Yeah, no. Well, <laughs> look, I, that one. we can say, we can like clearly acknowledge I'm the biggest MCU defender on this on this panel. And, and even I'm like, it's utter shit right now. So, Wow. It is. Yeah. yeah, no, I Nerd mean, says, yeah. yeah, Mr. Miller, how do you feel about Superman the animated series? I grew up in an era where all knowledge of comic book characters came from the cartoons. We as kids didn't bother with the comics, so I obviously, Batman the animated series might be the, the best superhero animated series of all time. Does Superman hold up, Josh? Yes, I mean, I it, it's the same team behind it, um, and it, it was really good. Even the Justice League series that they did was really good, um, and and they they you can tell they pulled enough from comics that it was, you know, true to comics to a certain degree. They, they took some liberties and had some fun, um, but they're, they're good starting points. And, you know, I was one of those kids, but that made me want to read comics. And maybe it's an awareness of, of kids of that age, knowing the comics around, I had older brothers that were reading comics. So they had comics from the eighties and it was easily accessible for me to pick stuff up. But these series, the X-Men 92, Batman, Superman, they even Spider-Man, they wanted me to search those comics out. And, and the fact that my brothers had stacks of them anyways just helped. Absolutely. I, I can say from my perspective, I really still, to this day, like that Superman animated series. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed it didn't go longer. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Kenneth, hello, guys. Happy, easy Sunday. Glad to be watching today. And very special hello to Mark Wheeler. I've been loving your work. You're bringing quality and excitement to the comic industry. Something is so sorely lacking. Yeah. Yes. It's I mean, crazy. I, Without Mark Miller, I don't know that we could do best of the week in 2023. Uh, Dude. It's kind I of mean, it, holding up the entire show there for a minute, Yule. Yeah, no. I mean, Well, he was pumping them out, you know. Yes. There, there was, was like always something years. either ending or starting, yeah. something leading into another thing. I think Magic Order was the book that really tied everything together as far as coming out. Yeah, you know, regularly. Yeah, it was surprised because I didn't like Magic Order when it came out. And then I oh, jumped really? back in on the second volume and I liked it more. And I went back and reread it. And I was like, all right, I was a little bit wrong, and I liked yeah. it uh, much more moving forward. It feels like there's parts of Magic Order that are like old Miller, where it's kind of like the edgy stuff. Too edgy you know? for me. The, yeah. the 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 abortion. Hero. That was hilarious, though. I thought you know exactly <laughs> what kind off. of character she is. She said, "My greatest escape trick was the abortion I escaped." You know, it's pretty hilarious to me. <laughs> she survived <laughs> instant death, yeah. but um, it is very edgy for him uh, in some ways. Uh, whereas he's grown since then, and like turnaround books, like I feel like a lot of people have said were like Starlight. That's where I was like, oh, Miller's somebody I can enjoy now because it's like, you know, it's it's a little bit more tasteful. <laughs> yeah, it's like the ambassador is, is is Mark Miller kind of grown up where mm -hmm. he doesn't have to see where the line is or even try and move the line to where where it used to be. It's kind of him uh, just doing his best writing. That's what. Well, when you have multiple it. characters, that helps also. You know, yeah. he had like despicable pieces of shit, people that are pretending to be something they're not. And, you know, there's a lot of other things. And he also have like a, the best artist on each book for some reason. Helps. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Good art. I, by the way, uh, I didn't want to put Mark in a precarious position Good. because the, the, uh, the artist that I could think of that I'd <laughs> love to see him work with on that Superman would be Ed McGinnis. Mm. I like that. I mean, I've seen Ed with you know, still Chuck Loeb. I've doing Superman. I've seen a couple other people, but I, I feel like Ed McGinnis is the least 
21st century quintessential Superman artist. Now that he's doing a little bit more thinner frames, <laughs> he's not like bulking them up quite so 90s style. I think uh, going back and doing his Superman would be kind of cool for sure. Very nice. Plush says, yeah. Singer Red Squat, Josh. Ask Olivia Munn. Damn. Uh, sure. I mean, Singer was a fan. Singer talked about it. Um, he's talked about specific comics and interviews. You know, when you go back to like the late '90s, 2000s, when he was making that first that first film. But um, I mean, maybe he's not a, a fanboy fanboy, but he clearly read some stories. So he he is though a bit too much of a uh, a student of the David Goyer side of uh comic adaptations mm -hmm. yeah agreed huh. look i'm not the biggest singer fan apparently but we you heard know. this we heard the story yeah, yeah. get it so alan moore <laughs> is oppenheimer basically yes that was the best <laughs> analogy i've ever heard in Kabul. that was that was perfect i was like, like whoa the doc tries to Back it up with some baseball analogy. I was like, what are you doing, man? Yeah, you I, should, I shouldn't have used the baseball. Here, <laughs> I should not have used the baseball reference with the Scotsman. Look, well, and Doc mentioned Barry Bonds, and the first thing I thought of was, oh, his daughter worked for me for a little while. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, Shikari. Not the Lewis and Superman cartoon. Lois and Superman cartoon. Oh, that was a... F I couldn't get that. <laughs> The Lois and Superman's not good. Yeah, stick to the animated series. Plush. Also, I think Reeves Superman with Clark as the mask is superb, but Bird and Kane making Clark who he is and Supes what he can't do is also masterful. Listen, I completely get it. I'm more on the side that Clark Kent is the hero. Mm -hmm. At least uh, his morals and everything he learned as Clark Kent is what drives him to be a hero, and Superman obviously is the power set. Well, that was right. what DC wanted to do because Superman was the boring character. He still is it to the people that don't know. Uh, you know, he he was the Superman that he was talking about, but people wanted Marvel, and they got John Byrne to come in and Marvelize Superman. Everybody that read Superman was thinking that it was going to happen, and it did. <laughs> Uh, you know, so there's your line right there. And some people love it and some people don't. Galb says, I think Watchmen work because the characters are original and Alan Moore is smart. Unlike Tom King, but it was done at the right time and era. That certainly has a lot to do with it, Yule. It, it was something that you really hadn't seen before, so it felt different. It felt unique. It felt important. And that certainly is one of the reasons it's held in such high esteem. If it had come out 10 years later, after we'd seen so much of this kind of deconstructionist kind of activities within superhero comics, it wouldn't feel, you know, it would feel like the boys where it's cool, but maybe it's not that cool. Right. Um, it, it's such a, it also, you know, really the art in it is perfect well, also. Yeah. I, I mean, well, you know, a lot of Alan Moore, uh, if anybody has ever seen the scripting that he does for that comic book, it's ridiculous. And only a guy like Dave Gibbons could have pulled that off. And they just like really masterfully put this comic out. And that's why it's still so amazing. Tom King, you know, he's again, you know, shoulders of giants and stuff like that. Every mm -hmm. generation has them, but it just feels like everybody now has like this, this, um, I got to get in touch with the, 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 emotional side of these characters it doesn't matter if it's the stephanie's or teeny or tom's or what it, the stephanie and tom's of the world of the comic book world <laughs> i i do need to disagree though oh thank you that, that they were not 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 with that part um with the the idea that they were original characters i'm Same. sorry they were oh not. well sure they were yeah. the charlton characters in everything yes. but name dude it would have fucking been even well, maybe not because I think the looks were so good in Watchmen. But could you imagine, like you know, Captain Adam instead of Doctor Manhattan? It, it would know? have it would have been um, Legion in um, uh, the uh, what was it back DD in the, or DC DC Legion uh, of Superheroes? Yeah, Legion of Superheroes back when. Uh, Paul Levitz was on it and just building that that series. 
mm-hmm. and making it into the biggest book next to Teen Titans. Yeah, it's um, crazy that that could happen. That's that's what it would have felt like. Yeah, um, it would have felt like like nineteen seventies and eighties Legion. If if the Charlton, I think it's better without the Charlton characters because it doesn't have the expert expectations or the history of the characters attached to it. Yeah, it would have been more of an in the moment thing probably than a a lasting thing. Yeah, yeah. Joey seventy, Joey R seventy five, Jupiter Legacy was one of my favorite shows. Was heartbroken when it was going and got canceled. Yeah, that was my thoughts too. So let's not let that happen with Chosen. Let's go and evangelize for it. Doc? Yes. Whoa. Did you guys see that? Did the power go out? Oh, for you? Yeah, that was weird. Yeah, I think I might have had yeah. just had a power fluctuation. I don't know. It's gonna go yeah, you would probably like out. the Chosen Wood, Doc. Yeah, I know. It's it's I, since I was traveling. You know, so it's much, American Jesus. I know. Since I had since I was uh, traveling so much, I haven't had a chance to start it yet. But I'm going to make sure that that gets done this week. I started it with my with my kids. I I watch some TV at the end of the evening when I'm with them. But there's an opening scene where a lady's getting um, getting the business end of something. And I was like, the kids can't watch that. This is a little bit too much for them. So I had to turn it off. But I am going to get to it. Absolutely. She was getting pile drived. It was wrestling. Uh, it didn't look <laughs> like wrestling. It was rough. Like, well, it was it's a pretty form realistic. of wrestling. Uh, I mean, not. I mean, she was like taking a beating of her life uh, to open that one up. So I would know. I wouldn't start it with the, your little kids in the room. You might freak them out. But we'll see. Hopefully, that one goes very well. It sounds like it's doing well. It's got some staying power. Nerd wants to know. Anyone can answer My Hero Academia or X Men in its prime. X Men in its prime. I so I haven't read My Hero Academia, so I can't say it. So I have to go X Men. Unfortunately, yeah, same. I don't yeah. really read a lot of manga. There's a bunch of losers <laughs> around here. It's My Hero Academia. Clearly, it's all mine. Well, I've thought about it. You know, I have them in the store, but no. it's the same exact okay. series. Then go read the original and not the replica. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the the oh, I'm not slamming X-Men run it is the greatest way. comic run of all times. There you go. Fair. Infamy says here yeah. at my academia. Yeah. It's unfortunate this isn't the uh, the uh, manga aficionados. You probably could have got a different answer, nerd. To be completely honest. Get it wants to know, Mark. I'm writing a superhero comic now. What is your process uh, to writing dialogue? How do you communicate action plot, act structure to your artist? What is your favorite artist to work with and have, have uh, and have ever worked with? I cannot answer any of these questions for Mark Miller, Kenneth, but this is how I do dialogue. Anything that can be presented in the action of the scene itself should be presented there, and then mm-hmm. the dialogue should be as true to the character as possible. And always, once you've written the dialogue and you think it's, especially if you think it's clever dialogue, say it out loud and make sure that you don't sound stupid when you say it. That was going to be my suggestion. Anytime you write put words in somebody's mouth if it if they would sound absolutely retarded saying them out loud that it's it's a it's bad dialogue unless right the one thing i'll say with dialogue too is is cast your cast your characters um because i think a lot of writers especially new writers and i fell victim to this and this was the advice that was given to me cast your characters because it's going to force you to think of how that actor or person would say that line and it's going to help you deviate so people don't speak with the same cadence uh they don't have the same quote unquote dialect yeah um so definitely definitely worth doing that as well and always cast christopher walken in a role (laughs) christopher walken also, I, Kenneth, I have a series on writing comic books, and obviously I haven't written a comic book, but I'm only hosting it with, I got Aaron Sparrow and Mark Pellegrini, not quite to Mark Miller's level of success, but they are both professionals and very good. And we have an entire uh, episode that's about an hour and 15 minutes, I believe, on writing dialogue. And they'll break down their entire processes. And I imagine uh, they're somewhat similar to Mark Miller. Obviously, they're all professionals. So, Who's the best artist Mark Miller's ever worked with? It's got to be Quietly, right? That's this guy. I. It, it's he's a toss up between so many, him and, man. Him and yeah, Hitch. Worked, he's worked with so many. 
Yeah, yeah. He's I mean, he's worked with, with Cuberts, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, he's Who, worked with, I mean, all his creator is like really good art. Yeah, Kennedy, it's Sean Gordon Murphy. Um, you know, just a, a ton of artists. Ola Betty, uh, I'm, M.O.N., John Romita Jr. I mean, it just goes on and on. I, I, I want to I, go ahead. I was just saying, I want to flip this. Who would you guys like to see him work with that he hasn't worked with? Oh, see, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, you can see a nice, edgy Mark Miller comic book with some Capullo art, a little mm. horror flair to it would be absolutely amazing. Well, you I know, would, oh, so go ahead. Yeah. I would really enjoy seeing him script Jim Lee. Mm. And then he's doing Superman, and I think that Jorge Jimenez guy would be awesome on that. Well, I, 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 I would like to see Jim get a second crack at Superman. Since oh, they've worked together. Then. The last time Jim Azzarello. tried to do an ongoing series, Doc, he made it th halfway through the issue and quit. No, I, I get that, but my point was that I would like him to see him atone for uh, uh, the Brian Azzarello for tomorrow. There you go. Oh, says, that's there's a lot of atonement for that fucking piece of yes, shit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it took me a second to to, to bring it? up all the bad stuff in my life, and that was one of them. Thanks a lot, has, Doc. Has he worked with uh, Chichetto yet? Mm. No, uh, I would love. I, I mean, not for Superman. I just love to see him with Chichetto. No, I I, 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 I think he, on Superman. I think he yeah. did, but did he? Maybe I'm wrong. Chances uh, are. So Marco Chichetto was an indie. Italian comic book creator before he signed with Marvel. Yeah. I believe so. Who knows what I know they did? And then there's Kenneth has a, a good hero fight for me. One in particular I might like or, or not, but he hasn't told me yet. I guess we're going to get to it. It's next or soon. You, I, you I get, remember listen, seeing we're, it. we're up for anything on here. We do what you guys want. Lade says, just have Freddy become Freddy A bomb, abomination, and he and Hulk can punch holes in each other. And champ each other. Hulk versus Freddy 12 Chomp. Okay. Was sure. that the, the, the it resolution was a you were looking for? smaller one that I remember seeing, but who knows? Who do you think could beat Miller's nemesis? I don't know. Maybe that was it. No, that was Kenneth. I don't know where you are right now on that. Uh, I'm at 12.59, so I'm 25 minutes ago. Oh, jeez. You got a lot to go. Maybe we, <laughs> yeah, maybe because, we should try you know, and Mark's, figure this out later. Mark jumped out about 25 minutes ago, so it'll slow down now. I think most people were, were interested right. in the talk of the hip, uh, which makes a whole lot of sense. Kenneth is JSA versus West That's Coast Avengers. Saw. Not even close. JSA. West Coast Avengers are a joke, man. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the only thing that is more of a joke than West Coast Avengers was when they called it Force Works. <laughs> what about Thunderstrike? I knew, I saw people wanting to like like that, and I'm like, no. the toughest guy in West Coast Avengers is Hawkeye. <laughs> well, Thunderstrike was on West Coast Avengers. Yeah, uh, he, he's a well, well, What about Wonder Man? He was on it. Was he a, a pacifist lot. during that time? No, no, no. It was. So there you it go. was it was when he was not a pacifist. He was probably the strongest member of West Coast Avengers, him or Vision. Oh, Vision, yeah. Sure. yeah I was going to say, which was over there, too. Yep. It all depends on the age that you're looking at. Sure. But Bob Hall's art just doesn't do it for me. Sorry. But West Coast Avengers, at one point, was basically, it looked like the dollar store knockoff of the entire Avengers. You had U.S. Agent instead of Captain America. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, you had War Machine instead of Iron Man. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was the same makeup with, like, the B-list versions of those already B-list characters. Jane Foster instead of Thor? Uh, no, you had Thunderstrike instead of Thor. Yeah. Jane Foster uh, would have been better. <laughs> well, not at that time. <laughs> it's the new... West Coast Adventures, and it's got to always be that way. Can't well, I guess it kind of was because it had Kenneth is totally going to disagree with us on this one and tell us why we're wrong. You know that, right? On Probably. West Coast Avengers, being anytime, better? anytime there's it's, an obvious answer, he he he's got some, but really, and then he pushes his nerd glasses. No up. way, JSA's yeah, got does. all the heavy hitters. Yes. It's got yeah. Wildcat, it's got 
Wildcat, <laughs> Mr. Terrific, Power it's got Girl. that. It doesn't matter if it's the old guy with the boat, the young young old guy with the bow tie, or the black. You got the uh, Hawkman. You take out Thunder, all of them by himself. Johnny Thunder, Doctor Fate, Doctor Fate. Sometimes yeah. Superman, Hawk. Yeah, Hawkman. Yeah, just could be a rough one. Late says, "I wish we could uh, see you try to write a Bond script." Oh, yeah, Wait, I'm super duper happy did. to have this kind of faith in me, man. Well, he did do a Bond script. <laughs> he did. Uh, it was called The King of Spies. The King of Spies. Old yeah. Man Bond. It was absolutely amazing, too. If you ever read that one, Layton, I hope that you did. That one was really, really good. I'm man. just hoping that um, I, I would still like to. I, I, I was just disappointed that it only lasted four issues. I feel like mm-hmm. he could have he could have caused so much more mayhem. Should have done a few soul, uh, volumes of that one. Jasper played nine was going to ask, are you still friendly with Grandpa Grant being Grant Morrison, I imagine? To my knowledge, and I've never asked Mark about this, but I- I'm pretty sure they're not friends. It sounds like they don't even speak to each other anymore, right? I, I'm I'm not going to. I, I, had heard, I had heard that same rumor, but I... I heard I, that I, rumor. Yeah. We'll ask him never on the actually, third appearance. Well, how yeah, I've doing. never actually asked him about it. And honestly, I don't know if I'd really want to. I definitely wouldn't want to ask him publicly because I feel like that'd be it'd be a little too much of a I don't know shot yeah, across. It might the be bow. stuff he doesn't want to talk about. Are you about kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? To say, hey, uh, Mark, I just want to let you know I'm really looking at a fifty to a hundred thousand uh, viewed video. You know, <laughs> something like that. So we're gonna you specifically can- talk about you and Grant Morrison. <laughs> Just up front, let him know that. If you can, then it'll be good. <laughs> That'll be a good one. My whole internet went down, didn't it? Yeah, I, it did. I yeah. Don't worry, I, I said something good. stupid. I'm sure it was great. Kenneth you know, wants to know Nightcrawler versus Nightwing. Nightcrawler. Yeah, um, Nightcrawler. He can teleport Dick's head right off his body. Yeah, but he wouldn't do that because Nightcrawler yeah, doesn't that's, kill. That's the problem. I mean, but are we can, talking like an MMA fight, like man. UFC rules? You get five, uh, your three five minute rounds or something like this. I, I guess Nightcrawler would have to beat him because Nightwing's not fast enough to get to him. Yeah, and if if Nightcrawler decides that he's even if Nightwing like wears him out, all he's got to do is teleport him to Limbo and then just leave him there. And but come then the back other and, thing like, is, chill out. In, in early X Men, Nightcrawler had limitations. If he teleported too much, he would get really tired and vulnerable. Though he's not yeah. that bad right now. Or, he doesn't really I don't do know that if anymore. that's true. <laughs> like it doesn't feel like there's any limitations on Nightcrawler anymore. Yeah, I don't know what he's like anymore. We'll wait till Uncanny uh, Nightcrawler starts up. Uh, I thought that was already going. And not failing. Yet. It's like another week or so. Oh yeah, the one where he comes, Spider Man. Yeah. All right, Doc. What's your final word? You're the Marvel aficionado. Nightcrawler versus Nightwing. UFC fight. Five five minute rounds. Who wins? I'm going with Nightcrawler because while okay, let's exclude power set here. Um, at the end of the day, I think they're equally talented acrobats. I think they're about equally strong. Nightcrawler has a tail, so he has a fifth appendage to beat you with. That's what it comes down to for me. Yeah, there you go. All right, Josh. You're the DC aficionado. Protect your boy, Nightwing, in a battle with Nightcrawler. Five five, five, five minute rounds, UFC title on the line. You can't yeah. teleport anybody to limbo or you can't teleport their head off. You just have to fight. Yeah, I think uh I think Nightcrawler is gonna be too worried about being too nice. And I think Dick's gonna kinda let him do his thing for a little bit. And we all know Dick's got some him. stamina in him, so he's gonna kinda let it go and he's gonna get that one hit in and then you know go from there. I'm going he Nightwing. He does have knockout power, and he gets the screaming sticks, right? Yeah, of course. If if Nightcrawler has teleportation, Dick has the screaming sticks. Yeah. Damn. All right, Yule, you're the final vote. Who do you think wins? Oh God, let's put this on me. Uh, sure. Uh, Nightcrawler. Got fuck tail. you, Yule. Fuck. Sorry, you. No. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> He's a fucking Marvel fanboy, Josh. What do you? Uh, no, I. You know, He's it's a Mark. It's, I it's know, and you work. know, he Miller's talking about you know uh, repping for companies and stuff like that. You got to know, I'm fucking selling comic books, people. I got to wear the merchandise and stuff to get people excited. Um, 
it, you know, I don't just sell the new comics that come out. There's old comics too. There's graphic novels and stuff like that. Show I'm people your rep- shirt because I want that comic book. You want this one, the Golden Girls one? Yes. Hell Is there yeah. a Golden Girls graphic novel? Yeah, man. Oh my God! There's some. There's some comic I saw that's going to be like based off a, a television show or something, and. And I can't remember what it is right now, but it will be coming out in the next few months. Uh, Dude, I know what you're talking life about. Comic. Which one? No, no, it's not Facts of Life. I no. know what you're talking about, Yule, but I also have forgotten what it was based off of. But I remember thinking when I saw it, that was a bad idea. I, I was like, holy shit, they're going to make this fucking comic book? Oh, and it's uh, Mad Cave, I think, that did it, is doing it. I could be wrong. It was something so, odd. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a Scout, Mad Cave. I mean, I think Mad Cave is better than Scout, but Scout, something like that. Um, that tier of comic creators. The Jeffersons. I, no, it's not. It's it's it's, it's not like that. <laughs> Whatever it is, is like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing it. All right. Do Nightcrawler is the winner, Kenneth. Tell us why we're wrong. Callum, I tried this other ch- channel called Comic Pals, and when I disagreed on Heather Antos, they called me every CG insult yeah. in the book. Are you sure you weren't a little bit more aggressive than that, Callum? <laughs> Are you sure you didn't insult them too? I don't know. Yeah, Callum sometimes can be a little edgy. A little He's a little Miller, edgy, a little bit. 90s style. Sometimes he's a little aggressive. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's never good business to just sit there and um, call your call your viewers names, I guess. I would never do that. Yeah. If I'm going to call anybody a name, it's going to be Doc. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what he's here for, right? <laughs> I'm sorry you had that experience, Cal. We wouldn't do that to you. Even Much. though you've uh, you, you put me in compromising positions in the past. <laughs> totally. Tampons <laughs> and stuff. HH the boys. Shout out to the Think Critical team from Soda City Comic Con. What's Soda City? I'm going to go... Is it Milwaukee? No, that's the... I gotta find out where this is. I don't even know where the fuck Columbia, it is. South Carolina. I never would have got it. I didn't know that was Soda City. Wow. I learned something. You new think every day. that that would have been Pop City down there? <laughs> <laughs> Comic book creation must be limited to those who truly love the medium. Out with the haters, absolutely. And HH, I, I saw your message. I, I got an email from me. I still owe you a response. I'm not ignoring anybody, uh, but I was a little bit overwhelmed the last week. But I promise. I will get back to you. My bad for that one. And congratulations on all the success. Hope everything is going well in uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. That's the home of, um, yeah, of uh, University of South Carolina, right? Probably some hot chicks there. I'm just listening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Kenneth says, I appreciate you guys filling in for Mark, and I know I've asked those questions before. I just, just wanted his specific viewpoints. He was great. He was absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. and I wish he could have stayed longer, but... Uh, his wife just started inviting all over all of her friends. And what is he going to do? Get divorced, or is he going to you know <laughs> get divorced to stay on the channel or go? Uh, Jimmy Johnson would do that for a Super Bowl back in the day. <laughs> well, yeah, he apparently. said it. He's like, oh, I have to divorce my wife. It's a very Tom Brady you know frame of mind. <laughs> so uh, I do appreciate everyone showing up and uh, it being very kind of Mark. He was a just a, such a gem. And that's the only way to describe yeah. him, Josh. He's oh, a peach. I- even you know you did your interview with them what a year two years ago I can't my it was, my like nine frame months, of reference baby. yeah it was a year um, like and, and I think that was one of the first times that I I really kind of saw just how genuine he was so um, we need more people like that in the industry both film and comics absolutely he's actually got a pretty decent head on his shoulders Kenneth yeah. says I watched Predator Predator two followed by Alien Aliens such great entertaining sci fi action movies crazy how these franchises started so. Good and then turn to crap. Predator, well, I think, is the yeah. best movie of the bunch. I, I think that's really? the best Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that was ever made, and probably probably like the most perfect action movie I've ever seen in my life. I, I love thought... Alien. Aliens is even better. I don't know about Predator Two though. Predator always felt Two weird. sucks. It, it was it was the one up until yeah. all the AVP movies came out and Prometheus and Alien. Resurrection and Those all were made of, by the creator, right? I, I yeah, I, I get it, Ridley but Scott, up, right? up until the late 90s, that was always considered the bad one. This is like I feel like all the movies that have happened since it Predator 2, 
um, and worse. Alien 3 have had like the prequel effect where Disney sequels suck so bad that it makes the prequels look okay in comparison. Mm. And that's what we've done to Predator 2 because at the time, everybody's like, I don't buy Danny Glover as a threat to the Predator. Yeah, but he was cool back then. So you put. No, I mean, he was cool. It was just a, a weird take on the character. It felt like they lowered the stakes, even though they were in a city, and I guess they were in Miami, right? I thought they were in New York. The New York? I thought it was super hot. Long. I can't remember, man. They were in a city with a bunch of... Uh... I've watched Alien and Aliens more than any Predator thing. You think it's... Aliens is better than Predator? I'm not saying it is. I just am saying I've watched those movies more than Predator. Predator is the best Predator too. merging of humor, action, and horror see, all into one movie I've ever seen. Doc in my life, said gosh. a movie that we did, we talked over. What was that movie? Oh, you didn't say that. Okay, I, I, I heard I Robocop. No, I didn't. I don't no, think I said Robocop. Robocop. Okay, Robocop. Okay, it's Robocop. It's in my brain. Robocop's, Robocop's Robocop. too campy. Hey, and uh, I, you know, this is like heavy in satire, so it's okay. No, I, but it's, I, it's a different it, topic. Predator 2 was LA, not New York. Oh, mm. yeah, it was, was LA. Not bad. Josh, is Predator the most perfect uh, action movie of all times? Come on, you're the movie guy. Uh, you got the Marvel movies. No, none of <laughs> people <laughs> like Secret <laughs> War or Civil War. I mean, uh, no, I'll take I don't Iron know. Man, I, Jesse, I, I, the body. I think when you what it's about Running Ventura? Man? Uh, running Jesse man the Body good. Ventura? Oh, Jesse I thought was... you said Ace. My internet cut out, and I thought you said Ace Ventura. And I was like, how the fuck do we get to Ace no, Ventura? No, no, I'm just saying, like, the cast was amazing. You know, um, the, the action was enthralling. The series goes from hardline action movie into, like, a horror thing. We got to do a show on this. Like, Escape yeah, from New York Josh's is a face. contender, so right? Happy. Um, I know the one thing that so I, you gay, mentioned, Josh. Um, the one thing you mentioned, like the, being the best, and I, I immediately thought of Terminator Two, though, and I'm trying to like sort mm. those out in my head because mm. they're both great. Yeah, I like Terminator Two, and that's an amazing movie. That's a uh, it's a lot of spe spectacle. I still think Predator is a better film, mm. but I mean Terminator Two is pretty amazing too, though. I. Kenneth wants to know, who do you think could beat Miller's nemesis? I don't want to say the obvious. Well, like Batman? <laughs> oh, I don't think Batman could because nemesis you mean kills Midnighter? and Batman doesn't. Midnighter. 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 Oh, now we're talking. Midnighter? Why Midnighter? Because he'll kill. And he's oh, got I the see. powers Yeah, that, that uh, nemesis doesn't have. Okay, gotcha. You know, Nem Nemesis is just a really evil to version kill of Batman, right? Deal. You got to kill Nemesis yeah, he's, in order yeah. to win. Nemesis is what if the Joker was Batman. Mm -hmm. um, Cosmic and, Ghost Rider, I think, takes him out. Well, I think those are the obvious ones. Anything Silver with, Surfer. Uh, anything with power cosmic, I guess, would probably be able to. Well, I was just saying it's Frank Castle <laughs> on steroids. He'd probably kill sure. him. Sure. Because you got to find a hero that's willing to, to murder him. Otherwise, sure. he's going to be like throwing the Joker in prison. You know what I mean? Huh? No? Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right, you. What other heroes out there that are willing to murder them? Oh wait, no, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, Wolverine. I'm not even familiar. I never read. Did you Nemesis. kill him. I feel like what? Nemesis just completely outsmarts. Wolverine. It's not my side. My well, style yeah, thing. That's the, the yeah. thing. He's so so genius. I'd I'd watch a Deathstroke versus Nemesis. I know that's kind of similar to to Midnighter. That could be fun. Uh, it would be fun to just put some of the like anti heroes and villains. You know, put Punisher. You know, up I, I got too. one. Hunter Rose would kill Nemesis, would be able to beat Nemesis. So go look Hunter Rose up, and then we'll have this conversation. What about Rorschach? Does Rorschach take down Nemesis? Rorschach doesn't do nothing. He's, he's no. smart enough, and he's, he's, he's never got a willing to kill. No. But I don't think, I don't think, I think Nemesis destroys him in hand to hand combat. Yeah. Me too. Nemesis is pretty smart as well. Like, he's pretty crafty, he and he's got he's a better sense of humor. Yeah. yeah, and he is going to come at you from 15 different ways, and they're all sideways. How about this one? How about Red Hood? Not as smart no. as Nemesis, but he does, uh, he's willing to use a gun and a tire iron. Yeah, I still think he loses. 
Um, I'm glad uh, you'll mention Hunter Rose Grendel. That that would actually be pretty. If you haven't read Grendel, go read Grendel. I'll throw that out there. Yeah, Matt Wagner is a favorite of mine. Anything he does, basically, mostly. <laughs> I think Dr. Manhattan takes out Debus. As Jose DeBee says, is anyone planning on seeing Blue Beetle? I am not. Nope. I saw it last night. How was it? It is the most generic, mediocre piece of anything. Like, you know, it, there's nothing in here. I mean, depend, if you get so been out of shape about some humor, like whatever, there's some jokes in there. But it is just... I walked away the same way I walked away from Ant-Man Quantumania, where I just felt nothing. I felt nothing. I didn't care. But there was stuff in Ant-Man that made me hate it so much that, you know, I guess I felt that. So I just didn't care. I didn't, you know, things happen. It's very Pembers. Um, eh, meh. I'd rather watch The Flash. Inoffensive is better than some things, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but like I hated The Flash, but I'd rather watch The Flash because at least The Flash for me had moments that I'd want to watch again. That's some yeah. spectacle. Yeah. The Flash at least tried to tell us a big story. Um, I mean, it failed it every conceivable way, but it attempted something. And from what I'm seeing from Blue Beetle, I haven't seen it. I'm not going to see it. It looks like they're aiming for like middle of the road teen superhero movie. And they're not even going to get there. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and it pulls from so many other superhero movies that it feels like a Xerox copy of a copy. Very nice. Kenneth says, nerd, all due respect, that is a foolish question, sir. Nothing beats X-Men in its prime, sir. There you go. Correct. He's kind of got a point there, though, doesn't he? I Do you mean, think that's what manga fans say about My Hero Academia? I don't know if they say that there's like a a prime my hero academic it damn me a period like oh yeah i mean like it never left its prime it's volume six through nine are the the prime my hero academias you know it's just the whole thing it's just yeah. that's kind of what manga a lot of times feels like to us americans it's just a vomit that you got to oh clean up just so much of it karen from nerdy girl parade how's everyone miss you guys sorry i'm late are you planning on making doc read deadpool manga I'm not planning on making Doc read Deadpool manga. I've already been thwarted my plans to make him unhappy by making him read Spider-Man fake red and him loving it and going out and buying the goddamn book. Yep. He liked it so much. Yep. That was not a good day for me. Doc, how are you feeling? How are you? She wants to know. I'm wonderful. Uh, Very I'm nice. final, I, th I think I'm finally caught up on fucking sleep from <laughs> LA. So All right. you'll, how are you doing? How you feel? Great. Um, I opened the store in an hour and 15 minutes and I can't wait to sell some funny books and do some orders and then put books out for next week. Very good. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Uh, you know, work's been good last this past week was a little busy, but uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff outside of work, which is nice and just kind of getting everything into place and uh, ready to hit the launch button. So I'm doing, doing good well? too. My kids are going yeah. to school starting Tuesday. Oh. The eight-year-old goes into third grade, and then the four-year-old starts nursery school at the same place. They got their uniforms, they got their shoes already, and they're ready to get in there. Nice. What's the look for, Josh? You said you had a look on your face. No, it's just because my computer started freezing up again. Uh, that's all. My wife makes the same face when I say something she doesn't like. Oh no! Like what did it I was, say this time, Josh? No, it was me making a face at my internet. Oh well, it happens. We're almost done here. Nerdy girl, who would win Deadpool versus Kaiju number eight? So this one's kind of difficult because Deadpool can't die, right? Kaiju number eight could rip him in half and he'd still be alive. Hmm. And then it would heal. And, and then, then Deadpool's be... got, got swords. I think he could go into the brain of Kaiju number eight and kill it. Am Sounds I misreading good. this one, Doc? I don't know what a Kaiju number eight is. It's a Kaiju. So it's just a giant random it's a monster. smaller kaiju it's a, like a baby kaiju okay yeah yeah no um it, it, deadpool will probably win um even mostly... if he eats him he'll just reform inside his body and yeah cut himself out that way it, it's, Wait, it's, it's deadpool is it's... kaiju number eight cute no no it's not like a cute monster or no, anything it's like, like a that? dude turning into a kaiju and he's like a baby 
Oh, yeah, he's like an uh, adolescent kaiju. Cute. How's that? No, because that look, cute. yeah, if it was a, like a super cute kaiju, the kaiju wins because Deadpool would like just start falling over. It. Yeah, they might adorable. they might solve everything with hugs, is what they would yeah. do. It's um, really, <laughs> but no, like the the power of plot armor will will save Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, Josh, who do you think wins? Uh, I've never actually read Kaiju number eight, so I'll go with Deadpool. He can. You he should can... definitely read Kaiju number eight. I Plus know, be like a monster <laughs> books like Hulk. It's really good. Is it? It is technically really? a. Is it technically a manga or no? It's not yeah, technically it's a manga. manga. It's a manga. Okay, yeah. So I'll be dipping my toes in into manga soon. Uh, I've already partnered with Carrie and a few people that will will be going that route for the channel. Oh so, man, get ready. Kenneth wants Buckle to know up. Ellen Rippey versus Sarah Connor. Who wins? Ooh. Sarah Man, Connor. So Sarah Connor in Terminator, Ellen Ripley destroys her, but Sarah Connor in Terminator 2 absolutely wipes the floor with Ellen Ripley. It, it all de depends on which version of the character, right? Yeah. When she's all gunned out and she's been trained up as a warrior. If we're talking about, you know, prime examples of both characters, it's Ripley's got machine guns and stuff, you know, flame guns. Sarah so Connor's Sarah Connor, she's got an entire arsenal in Mexico. She doesn't need that. She'll beat you up with her knuckles, too. Well, she doesn't need it, but she has it. She does. That's when you. But pull Ellen Ripley did have a mech armor at one point, though. That yeah. would probably be that the character at her at her greatest, and I think she would probably take out Sarah with the mech armor. I, I'm just saying, it, or look, I don't know these this, this, <laughs> these fights. <laughs> uh, what are you too good for superhero fights now, you? You only I've got always been comic too good stuff. for them. I just oh my goodness, Kenneth Josh, Dally put money down. I have to do it for him. Josh, you're the you're the movie guy. You are <laughs> yes. movie aficionado. Who wins, Ellen Ripley versus Sarah Cobb? I I feel like Sarah Connor, man. I just feel like she's a little bit more of a hardened badass. I, I feel she's like she's more. more uh, yeah, I feel like she'd be more adaptable to to her situations. So. Yeah, she's been training for it for years, especially in the second movie. In the first movie, she's a waitress. Ellen Ripley would get her. Yeah. Because she's got the size on her, you know, because uh, it's not a small lady. <laughs> Kenneth wants to know, I agree with you guys on JSA. I don't care for either team, but DC said it's more powerful. Wes, I know Grayson and Nightwing are your favorite characters and wanted to know uh, what you all say. Yeah, those are my, my favorite characters. I, I, I think it's so hard. If it's like fighting because you know someone's got to win, I think Dick Grayson wins because I don't think Nightwing fights for that. I think in in his heart he's a peaceful character that does what he has to do in the moments that he has to do him. But I don't ever think that he's looking for a fight. Whereas I don't think uh, Dick Grayson minds a fight. And that's kind of my take on the character, Josh. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I think you know um, we have some some tellings of Nightwing, especially when he was younger, that he was a, a little more like he was he was a little more open and interested in, in vengeance because of what happened to his parents. And I think over time he learned that vengeance isn't necessarily the best approach. And that's why we see him as we see him today. Um, but yeah, I don't think he minds a fight. I think for him, yeah, Nightcrawler kind of got hunted as a monster and almost staked in the heart, like a vampire. Yeah. But he probably forgave he, the people that did it because that's what's in his heart. Well, I mean, that might be true, but he still trains in the danger room. Cyclops is a master, you know, um, uh, well, manipulator. A no, not manipulator. A great like a fighter woman. is what I'm saying. Wolverine oh. is a great fighter. These are his friends that he trains with, you know. Uh, he probably could go toe to toe, and then he's got another. Josh, this is why you can't have the goddamn Marvel marks on the channel. These guys yeah. will never let it go. <laughs> Well, yeah, agree. Spider Man could beat up Superman. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm telling you, and he looks scrawnier than he is. And like Doc says, he's got teleportation powers, and then it's over. And that's the one thing Boom. he's got for him. But he's also got no uh he's got no fight in his heart. I don't think he's looking for the fight. Oh man. Caleb says, clearing up what had happened with the uh comic pals, apparently. He said, No, I said, but Heather's bad on social media, and they pretty much showed uh their shield behavior. For sure. But you know, honey and sugar and and right. lemon and salt. Did you not check out the channel beforehand? Did you not know that they were Heather Andrews <laughs> fans? Are you trying to mess with them? You got to lead with a jab first. You can't go full punch. You know, even you gotta, though this isn't like hard. Tickle core. the balls before you go in on the. Exactly. Exactly. Don't, you know don't I mean? drag your teeth. <laughs> yeah. Don't drag your teeth. Exactly. Well, we're not. I was just like to. I'm just trying to 
get their head on it in a different place, you know. Misdirect uh, is what I was yeah. going for, Doc. Yeah. Yeah. People. You got to be like, you know, you don't go all in immediately. <laughs> Get it. Predator 2 was in L.A. in the midst of a gang war between the Mexican and Jamaican gangs. I enjoyed it. Yes, the first one is better, but 2 is crazy fun. Danny Glover was big at the time. I would put Carl Weathers in that role. Carl Weathers obviously is a much better uh, action hero. and It would have made oh. more sense, but he was perfect in uh, Predator 1, and he was already dead. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Couldn't have used him because he was It dead. was so weird seeing Predator 2, and then you realize Arnold's not coming back. You're like, uh -huh. why not? You know what I mean? But I, I bet in comparison, Predator 2 is pretty amazing compared to like the Predator or Predators or Alien versus Predator or Prey. Alien versus Predator Requiem. I've heard Prey's good. I've heard Prey's good. I haven't watched it. I, I've watched Prey. It's not as bad as I expected, but there's a handful of bits in it that are really bad. Mm -hmm. Like, well. But for the most Maybe part, it's comparable to Predator Two. It it is. Um, the girl in it does not have any hope in hell of going up directly against the Predator, and thankfully, they at least avoid doing that. Well, neither did Arnold. You know, he couldn't take on the Predator till he found a a masking agent for his core temperature. Yeah, that was good stuff. Caleb says, I hated Beatles family and tacos again. I'm assuming he's talking about Blue Beetle. Yeah, it's so stereotypical. Like, so stereotypical. It's just, yeah. I well, love tacos. Stereotypes are there for a reason, too. You no, know, agreed. I mean, but there was nothing supposedly... out, There's nothing outside of the stereotypes. It's this just is, the stereotypes. This well, is, if Taco Bell was a movie, that's what this yeah. would be. Well, I assume like every aspect of this should be stereotypical. Like the super pe superhero part of it sounds like it's very mid. It's very mid. Oh no, that was in San, San Antonio. And I would go to the like the uh, the taqueria. There's always Mexicans buying tacos. Well, it's they funny like about it. that, it huh? And you know, a lot of people bitching about the tamale thing. Uh, I love when tamale, DC was man. doing those covers, joke. but you know, that's like a thing for Thanksgiving that oh, no, hey, order is. your tamales ahead of time, you know. Oh, green stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, it, it, you know, maybe it's just too many white people think the the, the the thing with tacos is George Lopez has named his truck Taco. So there's a whole <laughs> like arc for Taco the truck. Just well, and it's not a taco truck, it's a just a I don't like know why a, you put George Lopez in a movie in 2023. He's not look, like he's kind of funny, but he's not that funny. He was by far the best part of the entire movie. So really, oh, well, is it like one of the? It's like line. Blade Trinity when Ryan Reynolds is the best part of the movie. Yeah, I yeah, and it's like, but he wasn't good either. Yeah, it's it's just oof. Man, Blade Trinity was awful. Blue Beetle can't be that bad. It, it honestly, Blue Beetle was like those '90s superhero movies, but done today with today's production. Like the the evil the, Susan Sarandon's just mustache twirling evil. Like she says things in public that you would never say, especially if you're running like one of the top companies in the world. Like it, it was just it's too much. Cal also says the girls in My Hero Academia are real women and hot, especially that rabbit hero. And for Josh, all the men have abs. Ooh la la. Well, I don't talking want, about I'll, abs, Josh. I don't want beer guts on my superheroes either. Yeah, same. <laughs> Superhero dudes. The women in My Hero Academia aren't real, though. I bet they're neither high. are the men. They're Wait, all drawings. These aren't new. <laughs> these aren't real. Nah. <laughs> it's all drawings. It's pictures on paper. Jose to B says, "I agree with Josh." That's not a bad take. Blue Beetle was by the numbers basic. The villain was beyond basic. My wife and I felt insulted by the portrayal of a Mexican family being dirt mm -hmm. poor. Ridic ridiculous. Too many plot holes. Yeah. Yeah. I, like within the first probably like five minutes of the movie, they they set up all these plot points of like, oh, my dad law or yeah, the we're losing the home. Uh, the business shut down. Your father had it like and it's literally just spit out at, at a dinner. Just bloop, 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 bloop. Your dad had a heart attack. We don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Also, you've got Taco you the talking, Truck is in trouble. Taco, Taco the, the Truck is in trouble. Uh, the, the, uh, we have where are we going to get about, tamales for Thanksgiving? <laughs> right. We're, you know, we're talking about 80s action movies. We haven't even talked about Granbo in this movie. 
which is what I'm wow. calling her. She's a granny Rambo. <laughs> yeah. I'm not joking. That sounds I, like it might be fun. That yeah. sounds so yeah. terrible. I remember don't don't uh stop her, my mom will shoot. With Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. The and lady the lady from, from the Golden, Golden Girls. Girls. Estelle Getty. That thing yeah. was great, wasn't it? No, it Absolutely. was, but this was not that. <laughs> oh. It wasn't supposed to be like a tongue-in-cheek comedy thing where Sylvester Stallone was keeping his mom out of trouble? I mean, maybe tongue-in-cheek. It was just executed poorly. It went on way too long. Janet says, I say Moon Knight, especially, specifically Jed McKay, can beat Nemesis. Because he's skilled, professional killer, and more insane than Nemesis. Moon Knight wins. Yeah, possibly. That's a good that's call. A good one. That is, that's one that I didn't bring up, obviously, and he is a hero. Yeah. And he sort actually of. has the uh, the abilities to do it. And he's willing to kill. That's the big important part. Because if you throw him yeah. in jail, he's just going to escape. If Khonshu says it, it needs to be done, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Kenneth also says, you guys mentioned tacos. I also watched Demolition Man. Fun movie. Not as good as the others I mentioned. Franchise Wars? What are the three seashells? I think Demolition Man is way better than Predator 2. That's Dude, a good oh movie. God, I'm yes. thinking now, like, Demolition Man is one of my go-tos, for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's like, like Sandy has... B's first big movie, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And Before she breaks out in... Um... Speed. Speed. Speed, yes. Yeah, and you have Dennis Leary basically doing little bits from his No Cure for Cancer. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Rat Burgers joke at the end, which I thought was great. Yeah, the... Wesley Snipes with a blonde afro? Add in a little bit of nudity, and it would have been perfect, actually. Exactly. There was there was a tiny little bit of nudity in the uh, oral <laughs> sex scene. And no. I said oh. oral, not oral. Gotcha. I remember. I remember. There was a um, tiny okay. little bit. All right. Well, so side boob? I don't remember side boob on scene. I don't remember this at all. It, yeah, That's why was, Roadhouse is the perfect it, action. Movie. It was, oh, in, yeah, it was really in, the part, well. in the part where they where, where would gives you an epileptic seizure. Yes. Oh, I see. So they got a little subliminal on that part. Yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe, maybe we'll have to watch back. I like Demolition Man. That's frame. a damn good movie. Fuck yes. Dog. Got it. <laughs> it is. And I was going to say, back in 2016, uh, SDCC, there's Taco Bell right next to downtown or in downtown San Diego next to the convention center. They they converted they that Taco out. Bell to be Demolition Man Taco Bell. It was worth it. Like I, I worth I it meaning uh, me getting Taco Bell while working in the I convention. Done it. Absolutely, hell yeah! You don't like Taco Bell? I love Taco Bell, man, but it runs right through you. And if you're like, if you got like a five great. or six hour stretch where you're like going from one thing to the other, yeah, you know, I wouldn't do it unless you're going home. Wow. Yeah, no yeah. guts, no glory. That's what I say. <laughs> Go for it. Come on, playing a little uh, roulette with the toilets. Maybe that's it'll be right. there. Maybe it will. <laughs> i do want to say thank you very much to everybody i knew this was gonna be a fun episode obviously on a special day of time we don't normally do sunday we did it uh, two hours later than our normal start time to accommodate mark miller he was in for the first hour he had a no notice, no notice uh, housewarming party so we ended up having to leave a little bit early but he was very generous with his time very affable gentleman had a lot of fun and i was glad to, to be a part of this uh, yule how you doing buddy that was Dude, a lot of fun yeah, it was awesome. I uh, like I said, I was kind of. I mean, I'm joking about it, but I was really a little worried that I wasn't going to be able to understand anything. But it all worked out really well, and he does seem like a pretty cool dude. Yeah, I mean, like very much. You could, you could get in the weeds of comics with him and know that you could do a real boring episode for almost anybody else. But maybe. Oh, yeah. the, and he said he wanted you know, to come back. That's the best part. He yeah. still wants to hang out with you guys. I don't yeah. know. I don't I want to come back, and it's my channel. Yeah, we didn't scare him <laughs> away or anything, yeah. Yeah. You got any recommendations, Yule, for the comic uh, I do, actually. There was one comic that came out this week that I thought was really good. I sold out, didn't buy enough of them. IDW put out Godzilla War for Humanity. And although the art is cartoony in nature, it is, it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, and I own Fantastic Comics, and that's where I sold it at. I've ordered more. I didn't and, read that. One. Uh, yeah, it just looked really, really nice and very engaging. And I think anybody that's a Godzilla or just uh, people that don't read mainstream comics all the time would probably like this. And then I read an, a back issue the other day X Factor number 16. Going to do a little doc right here. Oh, nice. This I picked up. I was like, oh, this is drawn by Dave Mazzuccelli, who did 
Batman Year mm-hmm. One and Daredevil mm-hmm. Born Again. Daredevil Born Again. Well, yeah. That's the most great comic I've ever seen. This is a fantastic issue. If you didn't know that he did this and you're a big David Mazzuccelli fan, you should check it out. I usually don't really like a lot of other X-Men titles, but this was a really good one featuring Skids and Rusty and their powers and trying to get them under control. Mask is a villain in this. I didn't know Mask was a man. Did you know that, Doc? I didn't know. I thought Mask was a chick. I didn't know. Uh, Mask is a man and maybe even black. I had no idea. <laughs> oh. All right, Yule. The big question from Third yeah. Rail. I hope you find your missing tooth. Oh, Did no, that's a black a tooth? tooth is what that is. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Third Rail's been going on me. That's good. Uh, I I could get it replaced, but it's like, it's just dead. And the doctor's like, yeah, don't fuck around. It's a whole root canal thing, and I don't want to do it right now. Did Third Rail just make me be mean to you? Because that's not no, what it's all right. He, well, no, it's cool. I thought it was a joke. Like, you missed yeah. lost this week. Yeah, I mean, in age, you know, they they widen. If you have like like back here, there's a couple that aren't around, but I don't think you see that. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry. I'm know very you... self conscious about it, just to let you know. That's why well, it's the third the real thing. It wasn't me, man. I thought no, was... not you. It was a, it was, I it was an inside joke. This is obviously a Spider Man hat. You know, mm-hmm. just let you know. <laughs> I don't. In the old days, if you were bald, you'd wear a toupee. But nowadays, we make fun of people that do that. We wear a bowler hat, hair we plugs. Do. You know, but when you go inside, you take it off, and you would have your you know, tube. You know. There you go. Uh, these days, I don't. I don't do that. I'm not going to do hair plugs. I either shave it all off like now, and then I just put a hat on. It's sunny. If she out. can't accept me for who I am, then she don't deserve me. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> all right, Josh. You got any recommendations this week? Uh, I do. So from the big two, I'd say world's finest. I thought it, you know, it's fun. It kind of harkens. We talked about uh, uh, John Burns, Man of Steel. It kind of harkens back to some of those stories a little bit, especially the the meeting of Batman and Superman, because you got Magpie there. So I, I liked that kind of nod to it. Um, uh, it, we don't have Dan Mora on art, which is the only negative I'd say, but it's Travis Moore and he does a decent job. Like he's a solid artist. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, uh, the Cole uh, by Kelly Thompson, mm-hmm. I thought was, was actually pretty, pretty solid start to a book. And uh, the art is fantastic. It looks like it's painted art. Um, really, really good stuff. I think the art's kind of the, the win there, uh, but a decent story. I'm curious to see where it goes. And then Antarctica is keeping my interest for now. So we'll, we'll see how long that holds. Well, who's the artist? I well, I was trying to look it up, but my internet's being a, a jerk, and that's why I dropped out. So, mm-hmm. give me a give me a second, and I'll I'll pull it up. Well, Alpha Flight was good too. I forgot to say that. Uh, it's that. It says, "Great day today. Yeah, Enjoyed you guys, Ed Miller, and I'm a Marvel guy, and you know I love Spider Man. I would never say Spidey beats Superman. Ha, peace. But you know, Doc and fucking and you would say some stupid shit like that. You know what I mean." Marks, oh. both of them. Wow, that was Superman. I like Superman. He's a good out guy. of yeah, yeah. Wow. Never but, mind it. You know, the point. artist is Mattia De Lulis. Mm. Oh, but yeah, really good. Never it's heard really of him. Good. Thought you were Some talking about that dude stuff. that does all the covers for Marvel Comics. Like maybe he did it because he does painted art. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wasn't familiar with this artist, but I'm gonna be looking them up now. So. Wow. How's everything going on Popeye Culture? You got any big shows this week? Popeye Culture is going well. Uh, yeah, I'll be returning Tuesday. I didn't have a show last week because of some work stuff. But uh, we'll be back Tuesday um, with Culture Pops. And then by the end of this month, we'll have the first episode of Graphic Content up. And I've got my my Batman crew together. We're just going to discuss uh, Batman Year One. I've already kind of mentioned that I'm partnering with Carrie and some of her manga friends. And we're going to do a manga show that will be monthly. Um, and then, yeah, just going from there. So. Very nice. If you do manga, do the Promise Neverland. Absolutely amazing. Promise Neverland. Got it. Mm-hmm. That was a great one. All right, Doc. Last and least. Absolutely. Any recommendations? Yeah, I'm gonna go old school since mm. since Mark was here today. King of Spies. We were talking about mm. this earlier. Old school. That book came out last year. No, I know, I know, but it's an older book for for Mark because he he keeps knocking you know content oh. out like he's got like two books a month anymore. Three books a month sometimes. So, yes, King of Spies was fucking awesome. So go check it out if you haven't. Next, 
Whoa. This is an obscure one. This is actually the first appearance of everybody from Battle Chasers, like the whole cast. It was in Frank Frazetta's Fantasy Illustrated. Huh. I don't remember which issue this is, but it's you know big oversized magazine format. And there's like an eight page story from uh, jo- uh, Joe Mad in it. Whoa. So, All right. So if you can find this, go pick Such it up. A nerd. I am. That's pretty good. Pretty and good. And more mark since mark was here authority this is absolute authority volume two uh let's see here yep that's the it's got the cool slip cover and then the dust jacket you know mark miller frank quietly um yes go go pick this up i love it this book works so well in the absolute format It, it really really you know that yeah. widescreen, um, widescreen comics really works perfectly in the absolute format. So check it out. Very yeah, nice. that's a good one. Uh, the Avengers kill babies. Yep. Harry and, says, uh, "Don't watch the anime for for Promised Land, Neverland." Josh. I, look, I plan on just sticking to the books for now. So we're we're good. We're books. good on that that's front. Good. All right, I guess that's the show, everybody. I think we had a good time. We got a lot of stuff accomplished. It's a good Sunday. Hope everybody's enjoying it, and hope you enjoyed the uh, Women's World Cup, Doc. Um, wait, what? <laughs> oh, they lost. The, I know the Americans lost. No, <laughs> the finals was last night. I assume you watched it. I hate soccer, dude. Whoa, soccer and the whoa. soccer and the metric system are a commie plot. Wait, who won? I gotta know. Who are you asking? You. Who won? <laughs> yeah see you don't know either because because you didn't fucking watch either because soccer sucks oh i thought it would soccer. be something i could i have customers that actually care about it and every once in a while i find so it was it was and spain it and england spain won Sp- spain Spania. Won, you know? Spania oh, won. Good. that's good i, I knew I who was in it. it i mean i didn't watch it i don't really watch women's sports for the most part Unless it's like the Olympics and it's like gymnastics or swimming. Unless or it's YouTube, short, you know what? Then I you know, love soccer, women's soccer. Women's women's <laughs> uh, Olympic ice hockey is actually really fucking good. If you're a hockey I'll fan, you, I'll take your word for it. Huh? <laughs> if you're a hockey fan, it is actually really good. They're way too. They wear all that stuff, and there's yeah. the people on the ice doing that. It's just crazy. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I can't believe this. AL is going to ditch out on us next week because she's going to be in Europe celebrating your anniversary. That's so I guess somebody has their priorities. I know, we, right? Yeah. Wow. Rude. Happy anniversary, AL. I hope you enjoy your yeah. time in Europe. If you have a chance, obviously you've already got it planned out. My favorite city in the entire world that I've ever been to is Rome. And it's absolutely amazing. Wow. Wow, there we go. Anybody else got any favorite European cities? Doc is obviously Amsterdam because of all the hedonism. Yes, <laughs> correct. Talk to me in a year. I'll, I'll let you know. All right. Well, I, I hope like you Berlin. have a great time. And email me and let me know how much fun you had. I miss Europe. There's so much good times there. All right. Later, everybody. I got to get out of here and have some chicken nuggies. Mm-hmm. Get out, everybody.